Welcome to the panel discussion on production forest. My name is Putra Pratama and I'm going to be your moderator for three hours this morning. And um, there will be four main topics to be uh, discussed in this uh, panel discussion, namely uh, governance, uh, restoring of degraded forests, timber legality, and uh, reduce impact logging. Uh, for that, uh, because of the very wide spectrum of the uh, issue, uh, we have uh, we are going to have 12 panelists, and we are given three hours for this uh, panel. So what I'm going to do is. Uh, we will divide this, the, uh, the time into two sessions, two uh, parts. In the first part, I will invite uh, six uh, panelists uh, with me here. Uh, and the other six will be in the second uh, part. And uh, for each part, we will have uh, 90 minutes. And we will use the time as effective as possible, so without uh, uh, no presentation will be done and uh, only uh, question and answer from the moderator and from the audience. So um, without further ado, uh, I'm honored uh, to invite the first six finalists to, to be with me here. Um, Please uh, come with me here, uh, Ms. Uh, Tina Filanen from FAO. Are you here? Uh, yeah, please come here uh, with me. And then uh, Dr. Juan Okma from the ITTO. This way, uh, Tina. And Dr. Hilman Nugroho from uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry. And the next is... Uh, Mr. Thomas Colonna from e EFI. Um, also, Dr. Himlal Barrow from, uh, uh, yeah, uh, find your time, it's over there, but, um, from uh, C4. And the last one is Ian Thompson from Australia. Yeah, please find your name on the seat. I think maybe, oh, here, with me, yeah, please, yeah. Um, probably by the end, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, please, 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 please. Let me take my stuff. So, um, because of the limited time we have, so what I'm going to do is to ask questions to each of the panelists. And everyone uh, will give uh, five or six minutes uh, uh, explanation about the topic uh, I'm going to ask. And uh, after six uh, speakers giving their perception, giving their explanation, I will uh, open question from the uh, floor. Uh, I would like to start uh, with um, Mr. Ian Thompson from Australia, uh, who was really, in, uh, he was among the first who committed to be here with us, but for some reasons, uh, he is not able to be here, but he sent his uh, video record to say something about uh, the topic we are going to discuss today. And uh, so that's why, like, uh, just setting the stage for us, I will uh, play the video from uh, Australia for us all to view. Please, uh, Bobby, can you put the uh, video of Ian Thompson? Good morning. I'm Ian Thompson from the Australia Department of Agriculture and Water Resources. Every day I see Australia and the world take another step towards more sustainable development, including sustainable forest management. Forests deliver a range of functions, such as clean air, fresh water, shelter and food. They provide habitat for animals and they store carbon. Oh. And we enjoy forests for recreation and for their natural beauty. 
Forests provide wood for construction and furniture, fuel for our heating and cooking, and fibre for our paper. Our reliance on forests is significant, and we've been increasingly creative in harnessing the many benefits they offer. But as citizens, we are more actively now considering the outcomes of our actions, and our governments and forest managers are increasingly being held to account by the community and by the consumers. We must recognise the world has its challenges in managing our forests, and the pressure on our production forests is only going to continue. The World Bank predicts the demand for timber products alone will quadruple by 2050. Sustainable management of our production forests will be crucial to addressing this challenge. In Australia, we're committed to sustainable forest management to manage this precious resource now and into the future. We do this through development and implementation of forest management plans based on science, through effective and regular forest monitoring and reporting, and through the creation of research and development hubs, to name just a few initiatives. But we don't only have a role to play in ensuring we manage Australia's forests in a sustainable manner. Australia is a net importer of wood products and we need to make sure the timber we use is not sourced from the destructive practices of illegal logging. In 2012, Australia implemented strict laws to combat illegal logging and associated trade. These laws complement those established in the United States, the European Union and an increasing number of our Asian Pacific neighbours, including Indonesia. They create the necessary regulatory framework for behavioural change, promoting a market that avoids timber that can't be traced to legal sources. However, combating illegal logging is not just about halting the trade in illegally harvested timber. We must also facilitate and promote the trade in legally harvested timber products so that legal operators and sustainable forest managers get value for doing the right thing so they get returns on their investments to plant more trees and to continue to sustainably manage forests for future generations. For those of us working in the productive forest sector, governments and the private sector, we recognise the community's expectations on how we manage our forests. Promoting the trade in legally harvested timber is one way we can remove the taint that illegal logging brings to our industries. In my mind, the message on the management of our forests is clear. We must value all the benefits of our forests and tell their story. This includes their ability to provide for both environmental values and sustainable timber production. To promote the recognition of timber as a truly renewable product. The Asia Pacific is an extremely diverse region and I'm confident that our collective experiences and knowledge will help shape the future sustainable management of our forests. I'm sorry that I can't be with you today or have the opportunity to see Indonesia's magnificent forests. I wish you a very fruitful discussion on production forests. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was um, answer to question we sent to Dr. Uh, Mr. Ian Thompson. Uh, uh, the question was uh, mainly about Australian uh, implementation of illegal logging Prohibi prohibition act and also uh, regarding the country specific guideline Australia already signs with Indonesia and uh, our question was whether uh, those two instruments uh, have been very effective in prohibiting illegal timber to enter Australia and what's the impact to the business and so on so we got the uh, answer uh, uh, from uh, Mr. Ian Thompson and we can discuss further about that later on. So um, now I would like to uh, turn to our uh, panelists from uh, FAO, Ms. Tina Vahanen, uh, she is an officer from FAO and uh, the question I would like her to respond is uh, regarding the what is the view from the FAO side about the uh, forest and forestry in the Asia Pacific region? Uh, what is the trajectory, whether they are changing, uh, 
where there are chains uh, taking place toward betterment or worse, and what is the uh, FAO predictions about the situation of uh, production forest in the Asia Pacific, and uh, what is the recommendation to countries in the regions. Please, uh, Tina, uh, the floor is yours for five or maybe six minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I do have my PowerPoint there. It's just on the back of the, my, my few, uh, short presentation. Thank you so much for inviting me into this panel. The, your question is very broad. Uh, I may not have the answers at this stage on what is the future for, for all the uh, trade or the production um, uh, 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 from the production forests, but I can tell you from the outset that FAO is preparing uh, a, a next outlook study for 2030 that includes all these aspects. It's a study we do every 10 years, and the next study will be released uh, end of next year. So next year we'll be having a very 10-year ten outlook for the entire region on the production forests and all the other aspects of forestry. Uh, so the, what, what you will hear from my presentation is just some, some insights to that. And I, I thought I'll, I'll in trying to embed in my presentation not only the, the trends in the production forestry but also uh, uh, on uh, what do we do uh, in terms of the sustainable forest management, in terms of the red agenda linking the, the forest to climate change, restoration, governance uh, that are part of the topic of this entire panel. If I could have clicks, uh, four clicks here for the arrows that show some uh, changes in the forest area change in Asia Pacific. And one more. Uh, you can see here, this is from the official uh, global forest uh, resources data that FAO produces every five years. This is the data from the 2015. And uh, you can see the, uh, the forest area change uh, as countries have reported that officially to FAO. For the entire Asia-Pacific region, there is a slight positive trend. And then it's break down in the three other bars. Uh, you can see um, in the East Asia, stronger positive trend in the increase in forest area. The South and Southeast Asia has a negative trend, and Oceania uh, has a slight negative trend. Next slide. So I was also asked uh, by, the, by the organizers just to put this um, into the global context. Next click, please. So as many of you know, um, the entire forestry and land use sector is well anchored in the United Nations Framework Convention on Forests. The uh, agriculture, forestry and other land use uh, is, references, is referenced in about 80% of all the national determined contributions. So really it's a sector, both agriculture and forestry and obviously other land uses that are well anchored in the climate change uh, and in the national commitments that countries have uh, uh, submitted to the UNFCC. Now, talking about the reduction of emissions of deforestation and forest degradation, the REDD plus actions, they include actually restoration. And yesterday's uh, um, high-level panel, this was also brought up that we sh when we're talking about red, we should not only talk about always deforestation or forest degradation, we should also talk about the other uh, elements of REDD plus. And obviously, then uh, the, uh, tackling the degradation, certainly restoration, is an area that many countries have committed, uh, committed in doing in their nationally uh, determined contributions. Uh, and obviously, uh, putting that beyond the UNFCC, the Sustainable Development Goals that countries have committed to that also include uh, forest and landscape restoration. And they contribute directly to the SDG 13 on climate action and SDG 15 on land, uh, life on land. Next slide, please. 
So just uh, um, obviously the concept of forest and landscape restoration, you are all very familiar here. But uh, uh, if I just put it this in the context of the, uh, you know, what it means for the production forests, is why we do forest and landscape restoration is to really to develop resilient, productive, multifunctional landscapes for multiple benefits. And these are four production benefits, so economic benefits, environmental benefits, social benefits, even cultural benefits. So the purpose really of restoration is to restore the, all the functionalities of the original forest and at the same time increase the productivity of forests. And obviously strengthen the resilience and ecological integrity and ensure that uh, the forest ecosystems can produce all the goods and services uh, that they need to produce. Next slide, please. The one back. Yeah. <laughs> so, for the global restoration, um, uh, uh, this is, there's an, there are many global estimates. Uh, uh, but globally, it has been, uh, as part of the global bond challenge, it has been estimated that 2 billion hectares of deforested and degraded land are potentially uh, available for restoration globally. That's almost a half or basically half of the entire global uh, forest area. And that's entirely south of uh, uh, size of, uh, say, South America. So the potential and availability for restoration of degraded forests and lands is, is huge. Next slide, please. I think you're pushing two steps. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Okay, here's the, the uh, and the restoration opportunity. It has been estimated about uh, 400 million hectares of degraded lands may be available for restoration in Asia Pacific region. The table here is a, is an example of Imperata grassland, uh, uh, the weed in, in Asia region, where you see some of the. Uh, um, hectares that, that, uh, uh, that are uh, uh, currently uh, uh, classified as grassland imperata and certainly then uh, would be available for, for restoration. So, next slide. Uh, just briefly on what is FAO doing on restoration. Uh, FAO has launched in 2014 a forest landscape restoration mechanism it supports planning, funding, and implementation of forest and landscape restoration activities. Its initial phase is up to 2020. Uh, in this area, in this region, in South uh, Asia Pacific, Cambodia and Philippines are direct beneficiaries of this program, and many other countries benefit from the global uh, um, knowledge sharing of the landscape uh, uh, restoration mechanism. Next slide, please. Then a few key messages on the restorations uh, in this region. So Asia-Pacific region has really high potential for forest restorations, which can contribute obviously to mitigating uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as this whole conference is about forests and climate change. So we want to make sure that the restoration is one of the key activities, potentially uh, the biggest uh, activity that can contribute to the uh, mitigating uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I want to link this also to the red agenda, so because often the restoration is not really directly connected. So why I want to emphasize red is that the red has the potential to create a more enabling environment for forest restoration as it works towards the improved governance and the clarifications of land tenure issues. That's a critic, uh, that those issues, the governance and tenure issues, are a critical part of the, of the red, which then includes uh, restoration. And there are also tools, uh, and I will come back to this in one more one minute uh, time. Uh, that uh, new modern tools that help us to detect uh, forest degradation and also restoration. And. Just to connect the red and restoration to another third agenda, uh, this is the forest law enforcement governance and trade, which is promoting the legal timber trade and better forest governance. Um, and I want to emphasize this, that I want to make sort of a, give a broader picture globally that, the, uh, that in my perspective we talk about often about red 
or uh, restoration or flagged and we talk about the acronyms while we in the end of the day uh, on the ground actions are talking very similar activities uh, at, the, at the local level. So this is just an, uh, a snapshot that what FAO is doing on the flood agenda here in these regions. Uh, we have activities uh, uh, supporting Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Papua New Guinea, Thailand and Laos. And um, next one, another one, next slide, nope. next, okay, no, this is, this is fine, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to highlight what are the synergies between the red and flecked agendas where we reduce the emissions from deforestation, degradation and enforce laws and, and, uh, and, and empower the trade. Uh, both of these red and flecked activities address drivers of deforestation, so they're really geared towards halting deforestation. That is the, one of the key targets of the Sustainable Development Goal number 15. They are, address underlying governance issues that cause deforestation and degradation, and they support multidisciplinary and inclusive stakeholder processes. Both of these processes, red and flecked, need a different type of monitoring and reporting and verification, and they both uh, address consumption uh, patterns. So halting deforestation is really the common agenda, uh, both for red and flecked uh, activities. Next one. And next one. One more minute, please. <laughs> so. So I, I mentioned that there is uh, new modern technologies for actually uh, for us, uh, uh, the countries, uh, to, uh, to monitor their forests, including uh, forest degradation and restoration activities. Uh, uh. So uh, FAO has developed a suite of uh, open forest, open source tools that have really revol revolutionized forest monitoring. And uh, th these are based on the uh, remote sensing satellite imagery data that can be processed and analyzed nowadays uh, uh, faster than ever before. The complex land use change analysis that used to take months and months uh, to produce can now be done within a few days or weeks. And this is just a picture of this type of tools that are available free and online for everybody to use and they provide uh, direct and free access to the huge massive uh, uh, satellite archives from Landsat, from Sentiland, from Alus and, and many others. Next. So just my, my concluding slide here is that that, uh, that I want to just illustrate that uh, these acronyms RED uh, and the concept of forest and landscape restoration and FLECT are really interconnected and at the ground level we should aim to work together to make this, make this as part of the bigger the development uh, and, and climate change objectives. Next one. And the next one. Just bringing back this, hopefully we're not using too much the acronyms anymore, but we are thinking what these mean actually on the ground. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tina Fahanen, and thank you for the response from the audience. Um, now I will turn on to Dr. Juan Okma from the ITTO. So, Dr. Okma, uh, Ms. Tina Vanen already uh, explained about the uh, situation of forest in the Asia Pacific. Now, I would like uh, to know uh, your perspective of uh, the same question, actually. Um, what is... Um, um, what is the, the key challenge uh, in order to put uh, production forest in the Asia Pacific uh, really uh, serve its function for the economic purpose and for the conservation purpose and other? And uh, how could be the, the, the big uh, challenge and opportunity for restoring the two million forests, uh, degraded forests in the Asia Pacific can be done? 
uh, what what ITTO can really uh, really uh, do to do that. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, indeed, my great pleasure to join important this important uh, panel, and I think it's a great opportunity to learn and exchange some of our experience. Tina mentioned very broad prospect of the uh, global forest sector, including the declining the trend of forest land, in particular Asia Pacific. So I believe that uh, there are many challenges. I think the key challenge would be in the forest sector, there is increasing the competition on forest land. I think this is uh, really the challenging issue where we, when we talk about the land planning. So I think the, uh, how to increase the, some financial viability of SFM in production forest would be some challenging issue. In the region, I have seen the concept of SFM has been well spread, but the implementation of SFM quite slow, I mean, due to this uh, region. So we need some more the, uh, review and uh, solid enabling policy and the mechanism to increase the financial viability of SFM in production force. Secondly, I think also there is a challenging issue is related to the uh, limited investment in SFM, particularly the production force from the national government or provincial government. For instance, I learned the main things in Indonesia. FMU, the management unit, has been well established in Indonesia. But the uh, investment issue are really critical. So our task, how to increase, how to mobilize additional financial resources from all sources, including perhaps the private sector, to implementation of the SFM on the ground. In this regard, Tina mentioned about some uh, potential of future. I mean, I also concur. I hope that more the financial resources to support the adaptation measure uh, for restoration, social management force ecosystem will be made available from the Article 5 of the Paris Agreement on climate change. In terms of the reducing emission, from forest, I think uh, there is an increasing challenge to address the reduction of emission from second D, forest degradation. Some of scientists uh, mentioned about the greenhouse gas from the forest degradation is an underestimated sources. So one scientist uh, in America, the Mr. Pacini, which was the establishing scientist last year, uh, indicate that the reduction in carbon density within standing force, force degradation, is accounting for 68.9% of overall losses. So the implied that carbon losses from force degradation is much higher than the carbon losses from deforestation. I think this is uh, alarming the information from scientists. So regarding the how to balance the conservation and, and development in production force and how to also mobilize, how to enhance the restoration in degraded tropical forest. In case of the balance of the conservation and production in production forest, I learned also Indonesia well established. I think the first step by setting aside the land for purpose of the like the conservation and protection and production on the sound the land is framework and the base of the ecological condition. Inside the production forest, we need also more the attention to strict uh, conservation measures. We learn the high conservation value, high conservation stock also. I mean, I heard like 10%. So what about some more than like 10%, 20% of the conservation within production forest? Secondly, or I learn in Indonesia, so why the application of social policy within the production policy? So what about 20% of the land allocated for social agroforestry, community forestry, social forest program? And thirdly, I think that in the production policy, there is a need to improve the productivity 
of uh, the capacity, so that uh, increase the, some financial the revenue, financial stream of, from the production forest. So as the, when I uh, came to the Jogjakarta, this uh, wonderful the Congress, I saw the theme is the protecting forest and people and economic the growth. I believe the, the production force can play a very important role in protecting people and forest, as well as the, uh, increasing the economic the, uh, growth from the production force. I prepared a few slides I'd like to share with you, very short uh, slide. Can I? So my slide, somehow, I'd like to share some of the lessons learned, what we learned. Like other organization, ITT also work closely with many partners in Indonesia. Uh, from the Lake Toba in Sumatra, we worked the uh, Lake Toba rehabilitation, rehabilitation of Lake Toba water catchment, and then also many projects in Sumatra, like the genetic resource conservation in the Ramin, also reproached Ramin in Sumatra and Kalimantan, and also some project in the rehabilitation or restoration of the Indian species in Bali for wood carving industry in Bali. And then some country I'm working with the North Laoshi to promote the ch champaka species for wooden house construction. So it is glad. So I'd like to appeal the, some project, the lesson I'd like to share with you. Can I have the next slide? Yes, the one of the interesting, the also, I mean, our the intervention working with the Tipterukap the Research Center in Kalimantan. We work together, uh, Soria species, and uh, we learn the many important lessons and uh, recognizing the importance of the genetic resource conservation. So how to increase the, uh, this the quality planting material when we had the bone challenge, global partnership on the land restoration, where we can get some good seedling to supply good restoration effort. So we are sometimes target-oriented area, but we need also at the same time where we can provide quality seed for the success or productivity. So this is some of the example. We learned that this the conservation of genetics require also commitment from various uh, players, and also we learned uh, that particularly the community can play important role in conservation with some of the income generation from the conservation. Can I have next slide? Second, the slide which I'd like to share with you, Tipteru Cup uh, planting in Indonesia, in particular the Kalimantan. This is, uh, I believe, the assisting natural regeneration, uh, particular focus on the enrichment, enrichment planting Normally, normally, look over area, not much the intervention, just the product forest, just remain as usual without any intervention. But what about with the planting, very the quality seed from the genetic resources to planting in a more intensive way in the rugo area? This is some example. So we call the line planting the technique. So about the three meter strip, the clear, and then planting the best seedling, like five, five, five meter, and then we show the, after five years, wonderful increasing the productivity of the, this issue. So we believe it's time to also review the, this kind of the wonderful the experience from the underground. So line planting would be one of the interesting the techniques. My last slide, can I have the mic? Yes, the CMS yesterday opening ceremony, Minister mentioned Java is now producing a lot of timber to Sumatra and Kalimantan. I think that we learn also with the Java. The, they had good uh, culture of the restoration planting. And uh, we learn the main things among other. It's important to move forward with the motivate the local the restoration leader. So we need more the local champion to promote uh, this the restoration activity. I think uh, uh, we learned this uh, motivate activity. When I met this uh, local leader, he used to mention that I can promise my quality thick seedling 
can be replaced or I can resupply if my the seedlings not could succeed or fail, I can replace seedling within six months. So I believe the local community and the, the leader, they can promote a lot of the restoration the environment in this region. I was so pleased and then I hope the such a the local the champion will be more the wildly uh, uh, motivated in many parts of the country. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Okma, for sharing uh, ITTO uh, experience and uh, perception about uh, forest and forestry and the challenge in the Asia Pacific, especially uh, sharing uh, the project, a lot of projects in Indonesia. Um, now I would like to be more, a little bit in depth on one of the topics already raised by Tina. It's the uh, the synergy between flag tea and uh, red. So I, I turn to uh, Mr. Thomas Colonna. He is from a European Forest Institute, uh, mostly known for its very active international uh, uh, international work in uh, helping uh, countries uh, to. Uh, face uh, challenge in forestry and uh, my question is uh, do you agree yeah, w uh, that uh, one of the burning or two of the burning issues is uh, about uh, uh, restoring uh, degraded forest and also about uh, uh, making sure uh, timber, timber legality and uh, we, all, we all learn that uh, European Union is uh, one of the uh, pioneers in uh, in the timber legality uh, issue in the world, and uh, there are VPA and a number of VPA countries already uh, signed VPA with uh, European Union, and uh, we would like to listen more from you about that, uh, the progress of the VPA, why it's so slow until now, only Indonesia already uh, uh, implement the VPA with uh, European Union. Yeah, please, uh, Thomas, you can use that uh, microphone over there, closer, yeah. Uh, thank you, Pak Putra. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here to speak about FLECTI in Indonesia the first country worldwide that uh, is issuing uh, FLECTI licenses, and I'm really happy to as well um, uh, present now after um, FAO and ITTO. In fact, we all work together. Um, we work especially with FAO. We work together on a daily basis uh, in Africa and in Asia, and I'm glad that you um, uh, already mentioned the uh, importance of LECT. Um, so clearly, I think, um, as highlighted yesterday, um, as well throughout the conference, uh, deforestation and degradation are uh, really uh, burning issues uh, that that are affecting society, the economy, and the environment. And I think the question really is, uh, what do you do to address this problem? What is your, the unique contribution of your organization to addressing uh, um, the problem of uh, deforestation? And um, I'm working for the UFLECT facility. Um, we are hosted by the European Forest Institute. And what we do is we support the European Union in the implementation of the EU FLECT action plan. Um, our approach to tackling um, deforestation is governance. So we support um, legal and governance reforms in producing countries that promote transparency, accountability, and participation in, uh, in decision making. So we work with producing countries to facilitate processes that um, ensure that the forest sector is regulated in a way that meets social, environmental, and uh, economic goals. Um, related to governance, and this is a big question for us, this is really a problem or an issue that we are tackling every single day, particularly in my work, is um, how do you address the trade in illegal timber and, um, and timber products? Um, I think that there are a lot of positive signals, particularly in Asia. Um, we see really a timber legality movement that has been um, mushering up over the past uh, couple of years. It's not just 
uh, the Lacey Act in the US, the UTR in the European Union, the Legal Logging Prohibition Act in Australia. We now have very important countries in Asia that are moving towards timber legality. Uh, in 2016, Japan uh, issued the Cleanwood Act, and that Cleanwood Act was implemented in uh, 2017 through uh, several ministerial ordinances, and now uh, the government, as far as we know, is uh, putting a lot more resources into strengthening it, uh, strengthen the implementation. In 2017, South Korea issued uh, a legislation that makes it an offense to import uh, illegal timber and timber products into the country. And that legislation is going to be implemented this year. As part of the VPA processes, countries like Indonesia and Vietnam have to develop timber import controls. So, um, and I will talk about China uh, as well in, uh, uh, towards the end of my presentation. So we can see really a positive momentum, uh, I think. And what's really important is the cooperation between regulated markets with then markets like Japan, Korea, uh, China, that are starting to regulate as well their uh, timber imports. And the more we cooperate, the more we exchange information, the more we make sure that, that the standards are maintained high among all these markets. And imagine uh, if you have key markets that regulate uh, their legality of the timber imports, that really has the potential to contribute to legality, governance, tackling deforestation in producing countries. Because it's not just a producer country's problem, it's also a consumer country's uh, uh, problem. Um, then there is, I think, uh, another very burning issue, another very important uh, topic that people sometimes forget. It's the importance of the informal markets uh, in uh, timber producing countries. How do you address how do you address the large size of the informal market and also the influence that the informal market has uh, on, on the forest? How do you regulate the informal market um, so that it does not negatively impact on sustainability? But how do, we make, how do you make sure that the communities and the small and micro enterprises who rely on the informal market do not lose completely their livelihood? These, I think, are some very important issues. And I think that uh, when you talk about uh, access to timber and resource security for producing countries, I think the way that you tackle the informal market, the way that you regulate it, it's hugely important. And um, this is a big issue for us. And uh, we have a program uh, in the Mekong region where we are looking at uh, trying to better understand um, small and micro enterprises. Um, we cover four countries in the Mekong, and we are trying to understand as well um, how you can address the problems, the illegality in the formal market through FLECT, and how do you make sure that FLECT does not negatively impact as well uh, small enterprises? Um, yes, and then you ask me, uh, Pak Putra, you ask me about um, uh, the VPA processes and the UTR, and then why they're so slow, and uh, and also um, the importance of key markets. Um, so maybe can I have a f can you move one slide? Yes. So here you can see the um, uh, FLECT action plan. That's what the, um, uh, the EU FLECT action plan that the facility is supporting uh, the European Union in um, implementing. Um, so you can see that uh, the European approach is quite unique. Um, it's a combination of demand side measures and supply side measures. So the demand side measures would be the uh, European timber regulation. So regulation at uh, um, that um, makes it illegal to place illegal timber and timber products on the European market. So this is a demand, a demand side measure. And then you have a supply side measure where the European Union is working with producing countries to improve their governance, uh, to, um, to support them in reforming their, their legal system to make, sure, to make sure that the forest sector is, uh, is then working uh, more effectively and uh, to ensure that there is legality in the forest sector and this then in turn facilitates trade between uh, uh, producing countries and uh, um, the European Union. And as part of the FLECT action plan as well, the EU is cooperating with uh, key markets like the US, Australia, but also uh, particularly with, uh, with China. And I'll talk about China uh, in, uh, um, in a moment. Um, so yes, uh, I think that VPAs often are seen as, as low processes, and I think it's an amazing achievement for Indonesia to, uh, to, uh, to have uh, having achieved the FLECT license status. But um, 
Uh, I think that a lot of people see FLECT licenses as the ultimate goal because of the trade aspect and everybody is, you know, cares about the economy and cares about the industry. But I don't think you should only look at the FLECT licenses. I think what you should look is the process, is the journey towards reaching that goal. Through the VPA processes, um, uh, the preparation, the negotiation, the implementation of the VPAs, um, underpinned by an inclusive multi-stakeholder process, drives governance and legal reforms that have a fundamental impact on the forest sector of all the countries that are engaging in the VPA processes. Um, the, the VPA process is, uh, uh, supports the country in securing a sustainable approach to address uh, forest sector uh, challenges. And um, countries create mechanism, they, they discuss the problems in the forest sector among themselves. And then they also reflect on the best practical solutions. And then they discuss these solutions with the European Union and get recognition for their efforts uh, through the VPA process. So these processes take a long time because they're inclusive. They, they deal with issues that are very difficult to deal with. Um, and so I think, I think that's the reason for which you see a slow movement. But I also think that, again, the same as with timber legality, now we have a good momentum. Um, also thanks to Indonesia having achieved FLECT license status. So we can see, it's particularly in Asia, I think we can see countries really moving. Uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Laos. I think they, uh, yeah, my colleagues are very busy <laughs> going in and out of these countries and, and supporting uh, processes. And also in Africa, I mean, I think a country like Ghana uh, is getting very close to FLECT license status. So yeah, um, I, I do think there is, uh, there is, um, um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of momentum uh, uh, on this. Um, concerning key markets and, and China, I think this is something that uh, uh, it's uh, always very interesting for stakeholders. So I, um, I spend actually half of my time in China. I uh, support the cooperation uh, between the Euro European Union and China. So maybe could you go to the last slide of the presentation? The very last slide. Go again, go ahead, go ahead, yes. So why China? Uh, China is a very important uh, market. I mean, if you look at trade statistics, you will see that China is the biggest importer of timber and timber products for almost every HS code that you can think of. Um, and I believe it's China is also the biggest uh, trading partner in, in, with, for Indonesia in terms of timber and timber products. So it's a very, very uh, important market. It has a huge uh, processing industry. Um, it has a nationwide logging ban on natural forest. And I think that these are all factors that uh, will continue to drive China's reliance on timber imports. Uh, so what China does to regulate the legality of the timber and timber products that they import, I think it's absolutely critical if you want to have an impact on, uh, on uh, producing countries. And uh, the European Union has been cooperating uh, with China now for a number of years. Uh, the framework uh, of this cooperation is the bilateral coordination mechanism on forest law enforcement and uh, governance. Um, so the European Union and, and, and China, uh, they meet every year. One time is in Brussels, one time is in Beijing. And then they discuss approaches, initiatives, uh, coordination to, uh, to try to stop um, uh, uh, the trade, uh, illegal logging and the trading in illegal timber. So the picture that you see here on the screen is from the meeting that we just had uh, in Beijing in March. Um, um, it, so it, the BCM really, it's a forum for, uh, for policy dialogue, but it's a concrete policy dialogue. So every, we don't, we don't just it's not just a dialogue, there is a work plan that is agreed every year between the EU and China, and the role of the EU Flective Facility is to, implement, to support the implementation of this work plan together with the uh, Chinese Academy uh, of Forestry. And um, one, well, one key objective of this dialogue is for Europe, the European Union to share experiences and information with China on the development of the EUTR, because um, uh, there's a lot that the European Union can share 
uh, with a country like China, who is now uh, slowly trying to, uh, to regulate their uh, import of, uh, of timber and timber products. So that's one objective. So we have studies, we have visits, we, we have workshops to try to, to bring the European experience to China. And then what we also trying to do is to establish a link between China and VPA countries in, uh, in Asia and in Africa. So if you have subscribed to flecti.org, uh, which is a platform that uh, informs stakeholders about Flecti initiatives, you will have probably seen um, a news item or story about a recent workshop that we organized in March in China, where we brought African VPA countries to China. Um, we organized a very high level workshop with uh, a uh, lot of ministries in China and a whole range of stakeholders, and we brought VPA spe uh, speakers from VPA countries to tell their story to the Chinese stakeholders and to tell them as well how important it is for China to regulate the timber imports in order to support the VPA processes in the uh, producing countries. Another um, project that we are working on uh, this year is the cooperation between Indonesia between Indonesia and China. So uh, we are carrying out, the Chinese Academy of Forestry supported by us um, is carrying out a study to explore how China could recognize uh, the legal documents from Indonesia as, uh, as a proof of legality. And, and uh, so I think this is really what, we, what we're trying to do. We're supporting the development of um, uh, import controls uh, for legality in China and we're also trying to link um, to link then uh, China with uh, uh, the VPA countries. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I just want to under, uh, to pick one line which is very important. You mentioned when we talk about uh, uh, timber legality and uh, legal timber trade, it, it it is not just the problem of the producing countries, but also equally the problem of um, receiving uh, countries and for that very reasons uh, having China on board is very very important being the, the largest the biggest importer of timber and uh, the good news is uh, uh, it is in the process yeah China is it is in in the process to uh, to be on board with other uh, countries so thank you Thomas uh, I, I believe there will be a lot of questions uh, Sekarang Pak Hilman, uh, Dr. Hilman uh, Nugroho is uh, uh, the new uh, Director General for Sustainable Management of Production Forest starting early this month. And uh, of course uh, his portfolio include uh, what we just discussed on production forest including the timber legality. Uh, Pak Hilman, uh, bagaimana dengan Indonesia? Ya, Indonesia uh, selama ini uh, ya dikenallah dengan negara yang cukup lama dikenal dengan negara yang menyia-nyiakan sumber daya hutannya, uh, sumber dari kayu ilegal dan sebagainya. Tetapi uh, dalam beberapa tahun belakangan banyak sekali uh, kemajuan proses yang sudah uh, dilakukan oleh Indonesia. Mungkin Pak Ilman bisa jelaskan uh, sedikit perihal kemajuan-kemajuan tersebut baik dalam mewujudkan pengelolaan hutan berkelanjutan maupun dalam uh, mengatasi illegal logging. Uh, silakan Pak Hilman. I think you guys get the, what I mean. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thanks Pak Putra. In this term I would like to talk about forest sustainability, timber legality timber legality, assurance system, flag and forest certification in Indonesia, in Bahasa Indonesia. Next. Indonesia mempunyai hutan produksi seluas 68,9 juta. dibagi menjadi dua besar. Yang pertama adalah HPH, Hak Pengusaha Nutan yang sering disebut dengan IUPHHKHA, seluas 18 juta hektar, 
HTI hutan tanaman Indonesia industri ini ada 11 juta hektar, ada RE 0,6 juta hektar dan perhutanan sosial atau kemitraan seluas 0,9 juta hektar masih ada sisa seluas 38 juta hektar diarahkan kemana diarahkan ke KPH yaitu untuk jasa lingkungan hasil hutan bukan kayu karbon sirpo pasture pangan dan energi terus bagaimana yang fase satu tadi yang dalam kotak merah tadi ini harus dikelola dengan SFM yaitu dia harus dikelola dengan lestari syaratnya hanya empat pertama adalah prasyarat yang kedua produksi yang ketiga ekologi yang keempat sosial ini nanti akan dinilai oleh lembaga penilai kalau disebut nanti di LP PHPL yang kedua verifikasi independen kalau ya kalau dia lulus 1 2 3 dan 4 maka diterbitkan yang namanya sertifikasi PHPL jika hanya lulus satu dan dua akan diterbitkan nanti sertifikasi legalitas kayu. Yang SLK ini diberikan waktu tiga tahun untuk menjadi S sertifikasi PHBL. Inilah yang disebut dengan SVLK. Jadi kalau sudah LVLK tadi masuk ke dalam industri harapannya di pasar luar negeri dan dalam negeri akan dijamin bahwa barang produk dari hutan produksi tadi halal atau disebut dengan legal. Bapak Ibu sekalian kita lihat yang namanya eh, bagaimana produksi kayu bulat dari hutan alam, hutan tanaman, dan hutan rakyat. Kita lihat di depan. Bahwa selama lima tahun, reali tebangan untuk hutan alam cenderung stabil. Yang terakhir justru menurun. AAC-nya annual Allowable cut masih tinggi, hampir dua kalinya. Artinya apa? Artinya bahwa Indonesia nilai konservasi masih tinggi. Karena jatah tebangan ada 12 juta, tetapi realisasinya masih di bawah 6 sampai 7 juta meter kubik per tahun. Kalau hutan tanaman industri, ini realisasinya 27 sampai 38 juta, tetapi e, rencananya masih jauh, yaitu 44 juta sampai 48 juta. Hal ini kita harus tingkatkan bagaimana realisasi itu harus mendekati dari e, rencana. Bagaimana hutan tanaman? Hutan tanaman, kita lihat bahwa data yang ada, ini masih di dalam e, industri di atas 6.000 meter kubik yang merah tadi itu sekitar ada e, 3,8 juta meter kubik sampai 5,3. Sebetulnya kalau di bawah industri, industri itu 6.000, 0 sampai 2.000 dan 2.000 sampai 6.000, insya Allah masih dia memproduksi kurang lebih 2 juta meter kubik. Ibu sekalian, apa dampaknya? Kalau sudah ada yang namanya SVLK, coba ditayangkan mengenai ekspor.
data ekspor jumlah ilegal logging senantiasa menurun dengan adanya SVLK. Dengan ada SVLK ekspor naik 30 sampai 40 persen. Jadi barang yang legal justru senantiasa naik, ilegal logging semakin turun. Bapak Ibu sekalian, apa upaya untuk meningkatkan produksi hasil hutan secara restari? Bagaimana kalau sudah SPLK? Apakah diturunkan biar tidak lulus? Atau harus dijaga SPLK ini terus berjalan di Indonesia? Yang pertama, unit manajemen atau HPH, HTI, ini harus didorong untuk mencapai SVLK bagi yang masih mempunyai prasyarat satu dan dua tadi. Kita dorong yang masih LVK tadi untuk menjadi eh, apa ini eh, eh, PHPL. Yang kedua, perbaikan tata kelola kehutanan dengan pelayanan publik yang lebih transparan dan cepat melalui penerapan sistem administrasi online. Tidak usah ketemu sama e, birokrat. Jadi cukup melalui online saja. Yang ketiga, penerapan multisistem silvicultur. Jadi nanti tebang pilih masih diberlakukan, tebang habis juga masih diberlakukan, tebang jalur akan diberlakukan. Saat kapan harus menggunakan tebang jalur? Saat kapan harus tebang pilih dan e, tebang habis. Yang keempat, peningkatan mutu tegakan melalui silvikultur intensif. Bagi HPH yang kondisinya kurang baik, isinya kurang baik, maka isinya harus dijaga. Artinya, Wadah perlu tetapi isi harus wajib, harus baik. Yang pertama, benih unggulnya digunakan. Artinya, pemuliaan pohon itu diberlakukan. Yang kedua, pemupukan. Yang keempat, SFM pasti harus diteruskan. Jadi kalau dengan menggunakan silvikultur intensif itu nanti, Penebangan bisa 280 meter kubik per hektar. Tetapi kalau hutan alam kira-kira kurang dari 20 meter kubik per hektar. Eh, tambah sebentar. Kemudian yang nomor lima peningkatan efektivitas industri perkayuan melalui pembinaan dukungan regulasi dan peningkatan akses pasar. Yang keenam pengembangan multi bisnis dan multi produk. Yang ketujuh, pengembangan pola kemitraan dalam produk hasil hutan dengan masyarakat. Terima kasih, Mr. Ceh, Pak Putra. Ya. Terima kasih, Pak Hilman, penjelasannya yang lengkap. Ya nanti mungkin belakangan akan ada pertanyaan dan we will also discuss about that in English. Um, finally, uh, I turn to Dr. Himlal Baral from C4. Uh, well, Dr. Baral, uh, researchers are free souls, so that's why that's why uh, we inten intentionally put you in the end, so you can actually say anything about the topic we just discussed from the uh, free thinking of uh, researchers. Uh, whether it is a critics or support or suggestion or what have been done regarding the uh, sustainable forest management, uh, restoring of degraded forests, and timber legality based on your factual research, of course. Please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here and share, um, share some of uh, our work about uh, forest landscape restoration. Uh, I intentionally put here for multiple ecosystem goods and services because when we talk only the services, uh, 
um, that uh, that uh, implies more regulating services. So goods is uh, such as timber uh, and other products are important. And I will uh, highlight our work in uh, in Asia Pacific um, uh, region. Uh, but we are working as a seaport. We our forest landscape restoration program um, uh, is. Uh, divided in three regions, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America. So different team works in other, uh, other regions. So my, my work I will highlight here in Asia Pacific region. Um, we have already seen this, uh, this slide, the restoration opportunity from previous uh, speaker. About some two billion hectares of land is uh, is available to, to restore. But when, when you see these different uh, figures there, uh, depending on what kind of data and tools and, and definition of degraded forest, uh, this can be somewhere between one to six billion hectares of, uh, of degraded land globally. So you can see the uh, inconsistency uh, about the data and sources and tools. Uh, so, um, so there is a a uh, huge opportunity to improve uh, what is actually uh, available to restore uh, where in, in which part of, of, of the landscape. So, um, as we all know, this vast amount of degraded uh, land in, um, in, in also in Asia Pacific region, which was presented uh, um, uh, previous speaker from FAO. So that, that provides uh, very little benefits to human and, and, and nature. So, uh, but uh, if, we, if we restore the land for multiple uh, ecosystem goods and services, uh, that, uh, that's, um, that's not only meet uh, one uh, goal like forest landscape restoration, but also supports uh, many, many um, benefits uh, and also contributes to, to different sustainable development goal. Uh, that uh, we can, um, uh, we are uh, working towards. So PFLR is finally getting traction, but uh, the uh, progress is slow because of various reasons. Uh, financing uh, restoration, uh, who will pay for restoration and who will get the benefits and where to start, these are the issues which I will talk to uh, next slide. And our recent uh, focus is, uh, is quantifying and valuing ecosystem goods and services from restoration that may um, provide opportunity uh, to, um, to, uh, to planner, policymaker, as well as financial institution to put their uh, resource toward uh, restorations. We are also working on uh, peatland and mangrove, which is actually parallel session. My colleagues are talking in other, uh, other room now. Uh, which I will not talk much here, and financing sustainable landscape, landscape approaches, and recently we are also looking bioenergy on from degraded and marginal land as a as a new restoration opportunity. Uh, this is actually covered by by earlier uh, speaker. So this is uh, what. Um, the degraded land in uh, Southeast Asia and uh, their uh, aspiration like target forest cover. So you can see there is a, a lot of opportunity. So this is, uh, I intentionally put here uh, why um, uh, to, to make a connection that uh, the amount of money required to restore the, uh, the degraded land. So uh, I don't know how, how much uh, you think to restore one hectare of land. So it's a couple of hundred dollars or thousand dollars or five thousand or ten thousand. There are many, many ways to restore uh, and uh, is it active restoration or passive restoration? And what is the previous land use? What is the land use we are trying to restore? This is different. But uh, there is a commonly used uh, figure from, uh, from uh, TIB, uh, the Economics of Ecosystem and Biodiversity. It's a UN initiative. They came with uh, about $2,300 as a, as a very like average figure to restore one hectare of land. If we use that figure, you can see the Bone Challenge, uh, uh, New York Declaration Forest, and also Sustainable Le Development Goal, the amount of financing required is, is, is huge. Even if we talk about Indonesia to restore two billion hectares of land, uh, two, sorry, two million hectares of pitland is even cost uh, 
uh, more than seven billion dollar. So if we use uh, this 2000 uh, like uh, figure. So that, that shows us uh, actually uh, why, why the restoration activities is, is, uh, are, are not taking like uh, momentum. So if we, so this is uh, the connection I am trying to make uh, here, and uh, so our lot of uh, C4's work is uh, uh, about um, uh, quantifying and valuing ecosystem services. So restoration is a, is a long-term process, uh, as you can see, and then this um, the uh, uh, initiatives for restoration can be financing from uh, from the benefits we got from restoration. Uh, for example. Production of timber, uh, in if we restore the degraded land for planting trees for, uh, um, for uh, economic value. And the other uh, recent option is, another option is like biomass and bioenergy. Um, recent um, recent uh, focus is going on after Paris Climate Agreement and also Sustainable Development Goal number seven, like renewable, ener like sustainable uh, energy to all and, um, and renewable energy has a great uh, potential uh, here. So we are looking how much uh, uh, cost to restore one hectare of land for bioenergy plantation or bioenergy production and how uh, that can uh, contribute uh, other social, economic and environmental uh, benefits. So some of our work is, um, is uh, restoration work is uh, in, in China, so where, uh, uh, as you know, that uh, world's la largest restoration program, this is not actually forest landscape restoration, it's more conversion of uh, cropland to, uh, to forest. Uh, some 50 billion, uh, billion dollar has been spent in last 20 years or so. 30 million hectare of land is restored and um, um, 120 million farmers are engaged. C4 is working very closely with Chinese uh, institutions, uh, especially Chinese Academy uh, of Forest, Chinese uh, Academy of Forestry to identify environmental and economic uh, benefit associated to these large scale restoration. And uh, similarly, we are also working in other uh, mountainous country. That's my photo from my home country, Nepal, where this, all these uh, mountains were uh, all uh, lands like um, um, degraded uh, because of the exploitation of uh, goods and uh, especially popular. Uh, but now has been restored uh, using a community-based uh, restoration for production of uh, multiple ecosystem uh, goods and services that demonstrate that uh, if we engage uh, the local communities uh, in restoration report, that uh, can be a cheaper, uh, cheaper option uh, compared to um, uh, compared to um, uh, other opportunities. Uh, so our work uh, about uh, restoration um, uh, have produced uh, some of the solid scientific uh, output. So that's uh, as a research organization, we have to produce this scientific paper. But I know the policy maker, planner, decision maker has very little time to read uh, large scientific, uh, a big scientific paper. So we communicate our finding through through forest news, uh, blogs, and short brief, policy brief uh, um, type of communication, which, are, which every week we update uh, from our um, C4 website so that uh, research finding will be easily available to, to policy makers for, uh, for, for their uh, um, understanding. Uh, to conclude, um, I will put few, key and few messages here uh, for, for the discussion in the, in the session. So, there is an opportunity to restore the degraded land for multiple ecosystem services. Uh, however, we have done a lot of um, study about payment for environmental services. So PES alone is not, uh, not able to, to finance the restoration cost, but it is, uh, it is additional benefits. But we need to produce some economic goods, like products uh, from the restoration, so that uh, uh, there will be there will be enough uh, financing available for, uh, for restoration. And identification, delineation of degraded land, uh, underutilized land suitable for restoration is key. So um, uh, where is the degraded land? Where is the tenure? What's the land use tenure there? Uh, what is the existing use? Even if we say this is the degraded land, but someone is using for valuable, that can be valuable piece for local communities. 
um, available alternative financing options and benefit distribution is key. Uh, without that, uh, nobody will be interested to, to restore large uh, area of land. And engagement of all stakeholders at early stage of restoration planning is, uh, is key. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Himlal uh, Bahral. Uh, now we have uh, 30 minutes or 25 minutes for uh, question and answer from the floor. So please uh, uh, raise the question uh, briefly. Uh, mention your uh, association, name and association, and to whom the question is directed. So please, uh, Wahyudi. Uh, I will invite maybe uh, three or five questions. Uh, Pa Wahyudi, and next. Uh, Santi, another one? Uh, okay, why don't we just start from uh, two uh, first. And Pa Wahyudi, uh, please uh, direct your question uh, to whom? A microphone. Uh, uh, yeah, please throw it away. Huh? We don't need the broken one. So. Yeah. Thank you, Babudra. Uh, I have uh, two questions and comments for the two speakers. First, to Thomas Colonna, mm. and second, to Dr. Barra. The first issue that I like to raise is dealing with flag T. We start with uh, flag in 2001, and then following up by flag T in 2002. Means that flag T already more than 16 years when we have an idea. It's very, very long time. My question is, although no, it's, uh, the trend is good according to you, but my question is, you are from Research Institute. Do you have any analysis why it's too long? And then how we can make it more simple and shorter. 16 years is very, very long, you know. You can imagine, when I was still young, in 2002, the flag tea already there, and I was one of the active person on the negotiations with EU. And that time, uh, please uh, comment it about two ideas in that time. First, of course, the illegality happens in producing countries. It's not because of the producers itself, but also from the market sides. We had the discussion about at least two things uh, under the uh, market side. First, we thought about the premium price, and second, about market failures. Do you think it's still right, the idea like that, for the time being? And then, lastly, for Mr. Colonna, uh, is there any analysis on impact to reduce uh, illegal locking and illegal trade for, from the FLECTI schemes? And then, if it is, if there is an uh, analysis, do you have any series of data? How much? And could we scale up to other activities or not? Because you are working for research institute. I think you have to, 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 uh, you know, to answer these questions, to help us. 
Second question is uh, to Dr. Baral from C4. You mentioned about restorations. I believe that you know the restoration of Indonesia is a little bit uh, different from bond challenges and other schemes. Uh, my question is, do you have any idea or probably analysis? Do you think that Indonesia restoration is much more on biodiversity uh, uh, issues and different from rehabilitation and different from forest reclamations? Is that right approach or do you have any idea? Thank you, Kuro. Thank you, Pak Ayudi. And Santi, please give your question briefly. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, introduce, my name is Farida Susanti from Diptoraka Forest Ecosystem Research, uh, uh, Research and Development Center in Samarinda. Could you put closer? closer yeah. Okay, thank you. My question to Tina and Dr. Himlal. Uh, according to restoration issue, uh, mentioned before, the different data and maybe from different approach to conclude the degradation, uh, degradation land. And how the discussion about the conclude or the parameter, I mean, uh, to the effectivity of forest restoration. Uh, as you mentioned before, and uh, maybe we can conclude the degraded marginal land criteria, maybe. Uh, what, what kind? What kind of this, uh, what, uh, how is your comment uh, of the restoration as investment? Investment because uh, for many purpose to gain many purpose and many benefit because we know uh, forest is for the protection forest and then the people uh, living in that uh, in that area. As uh, we know before, uh, why we can the same perspective to simplicity the, to determine the different uh, criteria to conclude the degradation land or the successfully of restoration. That Dr. Himmler said that uh, we can say at, uh, how many costs to restoration because there's many different way to gain uh, some purpose. Maybe that's my question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Santi. Uh, I hope you get the question, uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, well, uh, the question to Thomas actually further explanation why uh, the process of flag tea uh, so lengthy uh, can you make it or is there a thought that uh, can be made simpler um, that's from Pak Wahyudi and also more emphasize on the the role of demand side in in the role of the demand side the demand the market side in 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 uh, tackling illegal logging and illegal timber trade. It's, it is associated to market failure, premium price, and, uh, and also whether there is already study on the impact of this toward uh, illegal logging. And uh, Dr. Baral, I think the question is about uh, what is uh, the criteria actually in, in, uh, in deciding uh, critical or non-critical land because different criteria will end up with different uh, magnitude. Uh, like you put there, Indonesia alone has 56 million hectare degraded land. Of course, we refuse to admit that. And uh, uh, also uh, about the cost of restoration. So please, uh, Thomas, uh, 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 give your further explanation. Uh, yeah. Can I have my presentation back on screen? <laughs> Uh, yes, well, first of all, I would like to clarify that I don't work on research, although my or organization, like we, I work for the Euflecti facility that's hosted by the European Forest Institute, but we don't work on research. So the Euflecti facility really works on implementation uh, of, um, of the Euflecti action plan. So uh, we, uh, what we do is we support uh, the process uh, between the European Union and uh, producing countries. So we don't, I don't, I don't do research. And my particular role 
uh, within this process, uh, with the exception of Myanmar, where I am involved uh, uh, in the uh, preparatory phase towards uh, the VPA, I actually really work on the demand side. So I, uh, m most of my work is uh, with key markets. So I could, can only partially answer <laughs> some of the questions that you're asking me. Um, well, on, on, I think your question was also similar to uh, the question asked by Pakputra, why does it take so long? And this is something that we, yeah, we, uh, we are facing uh, all the time. So maybe, can I have my presentation back on screen? I think it's easier if I can show a couple of slides. <laughs> That's a pity, uh, because I have some data. Okay, well, uh, well let, let me first tackle the question on, the, uh, on why the processes are uh, so slow. So uh, as I explained, I think that is, uh, FLECT um, is a long process, because there is not an imposition of um, of elements by the European Union. This is a national process. So it is national stakeholders that uh, we have three constituencies, the government, the private sector, and civil society. And these three constituencies, they discuss among themselves what are the problems that have to be brought to the negotiation table and what are the potential solutions to these problems. So you have um, a stakeholder dialogue at multiple levels. You have a stakeholder dialogue within the constituency and then you have the stakeholder dialogue among the constituencies, and then you have a, a dialogue with the European Union. So uh, it is very much a national process, and I think this is, uh, this is really why processes take such a long time. And you also need to consider the challenges and the topics that are being discussed as well uh, by, by, uh, by uh, a diverse range of stakeholders. I mean, you, uh, topics, uh, themes that, that uh, have, uh, were, were very sensitive. Like for example in Myanmar, I mean, stakeholders discussing about conflict timber, about uh, what to do with conflict timber, uh, about the national peace process. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you talk about land tenure, you talk about, uh, uh, in some countries talk about conversion. I mean, these are all very difficult issues that are brought to the table and that stakeholders are discussing in a national setting. And that then, the solutions, to these challenges then get international recognition by the European Union. So, I mean, you can't expect a process like this to happen overnight. I mean, of course, it takes a long time. Um, I, I, think that, um, I think that thanks to Indonesia having now achieved the FLECT license status, which is, I think, the end of the uh, spectrum uh, in the VPA process, I do think this is bringing a very good momentum. And that brings me to the question about the demand side. Um, I mean, it is... Uh, Europe is still, the European Union is still a very important market for, uh, for uh, timber and timber products, but there is a shift, I think, in trading patterns that uh, more towards, uh, towards Asia. So we see uh, uh, Japan, we see Korea, particularly China, uh, absorbing a lot of the tropical timber and timber products, uh, and, and, and the market share of the European Union is diminishing. So that's why we need to, it's really critical that we all work together with these key markets to make sure that they develop uh, a legality assurance system, because this will then drive, um, uh, will then drive uh, FLECT even further. So I think if we could achieve that, uh, maybe Japan or South Korea, having now uh, uh, legislation in place, or in the future China, could recognize the efforts of VPA countries and recognize FLECT licensed timber as proof of legality, that would be a major driver, I think, a major incentive for countries, for VPA countries to really speed up the process and, and reach the, uh, uh, the, um, the, the licensing stage. And this is, uh, I think it's already happening. I mean, we, we are working now with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with China to recognize v legal documents. Because uh, this is something I really want to emphasize, that uh, um, the... Um, VPAs are really not just about the European Union. Indonesia, uh, Indonesia is issuing V-legal documents for all markets, so all the timber 
the Dimmer products under the VPA scope that go to China and go to other markets are also covered by the same legality definition that applies to uh, to um, uh, the FLECT licenses that go to Europe. So it's really, really important, I think, that in, uh, in, 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 in these key markets there is a recognition for the efforts, uh, um, uh, for the efforts made. Um, oh, good. Can you go to the... Um, oh, okay. Can I just show one more slide? <laughs> so, about the market failure. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, you can see the slide from the European Commission. Uh, this uh, is uh, capturing the implementation of the UTR, which is often quoted as, as, as a problem. Uh, um, you can see here, I mean, the UTR is relatively young. It's only a couple of years. And uh, uh, between March 2015 and February 2017, there has been 2,798 checks by competent authorities. And this is increasing and increasing. So I think there is a lot more enforcement, a lot more resources being put on, uh, uh, on um, uh, enforcing the uh, uh, UTR. And this, I think, will also drive um, uh, a lot more uh, the, uh, the VPA processes in, in, uh, in the different countries. So it's a bit of a broad answer, but um, uh, yeah. And, and one last uh, point that was made is uh, whether we're analyzing uh, what is uh, the impact. And uh, yes, we, uh, we're doing this. So. Um, uh, Recently, uh, in the last one or two years, we really started to document lessons learned to produce briefing papers. Uh, many of them are also internal. And we're trying to really reflect, uh, all of us as a, as a facility, on, on how we can improve these uh, processes. Uh, what's important is that you improve the process, but you don't lose the quality of the process. And you make sure that it continues to be a national process as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see that Pak Putra is uh, pointing the watch, so I will try to be very brief. I got uh, three, three questions, main questions. Uh, I, this is all uh, very, very important uh, issues uh, related to restoration, so uh, because of time, I have to be very, very brief. Uh, I know, um, as I mentioned, that restoration is different. There are hundreds of definitions, like uh, depending on which definition you use, so process is different, cost is different, time is different, approach is different, everything is uh, depending on that. Some people uh, say uh, planting tree or plantation forest is not a restoration, this is uh, creating another uh, uh, commodity or like, uh, it's a, it's a, like agriculture, you plant tree and harvest, this is not a restoration. So other use uh, that is a restoration. And your question about Indonesia's approach to restore the land for biodiversity and like ecological integrity, is this right? Right or wrong is uh, actually I'm not in position this is right or wrong I, I think for me it's, it's, it's good like uh, restoring land for ecological integrity or environmental services is uh, is uh, is important um, and uh, it's, 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 it's valuable if we estimate the ecosystem services that we receive from those uh, restoration is is much much bigger than the actual benefit from timber or other uh, services so that's probably better, but we need to find out who can, how can government uh, manage the fund required to restore huge, uh, huge amount of degraded land. Uh, the other question is very related uh, about uh, restoration as an investment. Yes, that's uh, happening in various parts of the world, even, even in, in Indonesia, restoration con concession, they are also doing uh, this kind of activities. Uh, restoration as a business. We are also looking restoration as a business for bioenergy companies, like we just signed MOU with a private company. They want to restore the degraded land for produce biomass that go for bioenergy production. So that's, that's a happening. So it's all, again, depends on, uh, um, depends on which part of landscape, how, how degraded the land and what is the value they're getting from there. And, but, uh, and uh, very quickly, we have uh, C4 organized a big conference about uh, restoration and like investing uh, financing landscapes uh, called GLF, Global Landscape Forum uh, Investment Case. The next is in May in Washington DC. You may be interested to see uh, some of the information there. 
and um, I missed uh, first pa some information from pa, um, pa Putra, uh, but um, uh, the, the idea here is not, I'm mean, this 56 million, this large amount of uh, degraded land is actually not coming from C4 research. This is the source I mentioned in the table is that's actually there was a restoration financing restoration dialogue in uh, organized by Recop TC last month in, in Bangkok and actually from Indonesian representative put that figure uh uh, <laughs> a, and, and as I mentioned there, there's a, some, the, due to the data consistency, uh, inconsistency actually, the globally two billion, like from one billion to six billion hectares. So you can imagine there is a very inconsistency in the, in the, in the source of data, which need to be improved. Thank you. So sorry, we are running out of time. Uh, otherwise, the next six speakers will be, <laughs> we don't have enough time. So I will not open another series of questions. You can raise, if you have some burning question, you can raise it in the second part of this uh, session. So uh, as a moderator, I think I, I have to give some points, uh, key points from the uh, presentation and uh, discussion taking place. Uh, it's not a complete summary, but first, uh, there are good and bad or good and not so good uh, things happening in the Asia Pacific forestry. The good thing is uh, in some part in some part of the region the uh, the size uh, of the forest is increasing in East Asia but in the other part it's, uh, it's slightly decreasing. The good thing is uh, the bad uh, part is uh, the magnitude of the degraded forest is still in billion hectares, so two billion. So although co data consistency is an issue here, whether it's two or three or six, it depends on the definition you use. Uh, the good thing about this is degraded forest is not seen merely as a problem. It's an opportunity. It's opportunity for investment. Uh, an opportunity to uh, implement Red Plus and to synergize Red Plus and uh, uh, Flag T even. And uh, the other good thing is, uh, especially in Indonesia, there are a lot of progress already on uh, attaining sustainable forest management and also on uh, tackling illegal logging and illegal timber trade. Uh, with regard to tackling illegal timber trade, it's not only uh, an issue in the producing countries, but now even the burden is shift into the uh, demand uh, side. Uh, and uh, the process of uh, PPA or flag tea is unavoidably lengthy because of the uh, process must be multi-stakeholders, and in different countries, there are different uh, setting. Probably in Vietnam, it will not take much longer than in Indonesia, or maybe in China, where we should be very short, as long as the political will is there. And uh, the other is uh, balancing production and conservation in production forests is definitely doable. Like uh, mentioned by Dr. Hokma, uh, we have uh, uh, setting for do that, uh, embedding social forestry, uh, high conservation value forest, improving production in one site. And the issue here is investment. So we need a lot of uh, private sector involvement uh, in order to attend this. I think that what I can get from the discussions. I'm sorry for not uh, asking another round of questions. We can do it later on. Please give a big round of applause to the speakers. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen and uh, lady. Thank you very much. Thank you very yeah. much. So now you are allowed to uh, yeah, go downstairs uh, to the table, and I will invite the next six uh, speakers. Thank you, Dr. Hokma. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, very nice uh, discussion. Makasih, Pak Hilman, Pak Dirjen. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Barl. Yeah. We will also have uh, 90 minutes. Uh, I hope uh, uh, you can uh, give your 
statement uh, briefly, so we will have more time for question and answer from the audience. I, I can see there are many questions uh, to be raised. So, uh, Dr. Ruth Turia, um, uh, thank you for being here, uh, from uh, representing uh, PNG uh, government. Uh, I would like to hear, we would like to hear from you about, uh, well, a similar question to the previous uh, segment. Uh, we know PNG is among uh, countries in the Asia Pacific, uh, endowed with a very uh, uh, huge uh, forest resource. And, uh, of course, uh, the whole world is also uh, concern about uh, the possibility of the forest in Papua New Guinea is also uh, toward similar, uh, toward uh, forest in other countries, uh, which is a uh, degradation. So can you explain uh, what, what effort uh, the PNG has been doing in order to prevent that from happening and whether illegal logging is an issue there, illegal timber trade and what have been done and uh, whether for example, you, uh, PNG is also ready to be on board with the other countries on uh, tackling illegal logging through the VPA-like uh, scheme. Yeah. Please, uh, Dr. Turia. Yeah. Okay, th thank you, uh, Dr. Putera, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for PNG. When I was invited to come here, I was thinking more of talking about production forests as how we view it, but I didn't realize that there were specific questions for me to answer. So in, in response to your question, I'll just briefly go through what the governance process is in Papua New Guinea. So if you just go to my next slide, I just want to show that within the PNG context, we're talking about three different entities. This is the government, the communities, and I think in the Indonesian case, you're using forest management unit, but for PNG, I want to refer to the investors. These are the timber company that is logging within a particular forest area that we have entered into agreement with. So if you look at the process that we have, as you know, land in PNG is not owned by the government. It's owned by the people. So that's why I have my triangle there. So you'll see that the government has to deal with the communities to get or access rights to that particular timber area. And then it will, the government then will pass on those, the rights over the management of that resource to an investor. So that's the situation in Papua New Guinea. So also in Papua New Guinea, we have three different levels of government. We have the national government, the provincial government, and there's the local level government. Each of them operate or apply the Forestry Act to manage the forest resource. The communities, as I mentioned, there's 97% um, of the land is owned by the communities. And the majority of our timber investors are foreign companies. Excuse me. And almost 90% of the log harvest out of PNG is exported as round log to China. So looking at the land use and land use composition as of 2015, I think the land area as you see is 46 million hectares. Out of that there's a breakdown of what each of that 46 million hectares is categorized into. So for the forest land, our estimate is saying there's about 78% of PNG's land is still under forest, and 60% of that is intact as forest. So you'll see that there's a difference between 60 and 78% which according to my calculation, it's about 14.4 million hectares of forest land. So you'll ask me what is happening in that 14.4 million hectares. That's the current area that is under logging operations at the moment. So 
So if you look at what we are doing, and as I said, in our context, we have a forestry policy, we have a forestry legislation, we also have the national forest plan that determines which areas become under, or comes under operation. We have the planning, monitoring, and control procedures, particularly for natural forest harvest, and a logging code of practice that guides us on how we undertake logging in PNG. So if I now go to the questions that were asked of me, the first one, I think I heard him saying something else, but the question that was sent to me was, what is the situation of forest governance in PNG? And what efforts the country has been undertaking to promote sustainable forest management? Yeah, okay. So as I said, the PNG's forest policy is all about sustainable forest management. And that's what the policy is saying. So the guiding principle of the PNG forest policy is that we want to ensure the forest that we have is used for the benefit of today's generation as well as for the new generation that comes up. So under that, under that process, what we have is that the government has to enter into a management agreement, as I said, with the communities. And this is for 50 years. That's a current practice under the new Forestry Act. And then out of that, we enter into another what we call a project agreement with the investor over about 35 years. And then we monitor that operation using the procedure of monitoring and control and the logging code of practice. So if I now turn to your second question, which says illegal logging and illegal trade is a lingering issue in the region. What has PNG been undertaking in order to eradicate the crime? Is there a sign that PNG will be on board soon with Indonesia and other BPA countries yeah. in fighting illegal timber trade? I think all of us as a country, we don't want to see any illegal activities happening within what we do in our jurisdiction. So PNG, I know there have been a lot of questions about what we do, but as I said, I think if we go through our process and our legislation, for PNG what we're saying is, and this comes back to the overall definition of what illegality is, I think the F, um, ITTO has uh, defined illegal logging as uh, something that is done outside a nation's law. So what we in PNG are saying is that we have our laws that we apply to ensure that what goes out of our country is legal. So from our perspective, what is traded out of PNG is legal. And I know a lot of our friends, I'm not sure whether there's anyone here from Global Witness, but these are NGOs. They, they have said that there's some record of illegal logging going from PNG to China and then on to the USA. Now, PNG was very disturbed about that report, and I know this particular NGO group has been coming to PNG to do further research on these issues. But I think my sort of request to people like that group is that you need to understand the processes that is applied within the country for you to be able to see what the process is, the steps that have been taken by the country in order to allow any export of timber out of the country. So the third question was, um, have PNG government designed any national certification scheme to promote legal timber trade. I think at this point, PNG, I believe uh, Indonesia and Malaysia as well have got the country-specific guidelines, particularly with Australia. So PNG has developed one that mainly to satisfy our Australian importers that what we are sending to them is legal. So that, there is a guideline that guides them on that. At the same time, PNG is currently working on developing its timber legality standard. I know Indonesia has already got your TILAC or SVK that's already in place. 
We are still working towards that. It's just a standard that we have just started to work on. We recognize that many of the international markets now are looking for certified timber, so we are working towards that. We don't as yet have a certification scheme, although we know that the FSC and the PFC are working, have something that they are doing. PNG on a voluntary basis, some of our industries are using the FSC system. But we are hoping that once we develop our timber legality standard, we will then develop our timber legality verification system, and that will assist us then to ensure that what goes out of PNG is legal as per the requirements that each of the customers or the timber market requires. So that's the process that we have. We also have a system called the decision support system, Mm. which is mainly a computer-based database system in which we want to capture all the information that we have which will assist us towards the TLVS system that we want to develop. Yeah. Yeah. So, in conclusion, yeah, my key messages are that PNG has laws that it applies. PNG... Yes is serious about the process, mm -hmm. processes of legality and, of course, sustainable forest management. Different country has its own laws and other avenues as the CSG, which are one way of establishing legality. Mm -hmm. And depending on our specific circumstances, we cannot be preaching a one-size-fits-all scenarios for proving legality. And this is something that PNG has been sort of emphasizing at international meetings. I know our friend Thomas was talking about flag tea, and we have been approached about flag tea, but we've been telling the EU that our export to the EU market is very small. We don't really see the necessity for us to have a flag tea, but we want to ensure that what is traded out of PNG is from my legal source. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rutheria. Um, please, a round of applause, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, now I directly turn to Bapa, uh, Dr. Indra Yuno Susilo, representing the Indonesian Association of Forest Concessions. Uh, Pak Indra Yuno, um, the role of forest or forestry in the Indonesian economy is, uh, has been always significant, but recently it's uh, declining somehow. So uh, can you explain why it is so and whether it can be uh, bring back, uh, can be brought back to be uh, one of the key driver of the national economy and, and uh, what is uh, your view on the importance of good coordination between business and government in order to do that? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course, I got this question this morning at 4 o'clock in the morning, so I try to answer this briefly without presentations. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee to inviting me this, afternoon, this morning. Just to recall what just asked by Dr. Put Putra, for example, just to share with you, uh, Director General Hillman mentioned that yes, last year, Indonesia contributed 10 billion US dollar revenue coming from the forest sector. And this is coming from uh, HTI and HPH, out of which we realize that still not as what being targeted by our government. You, I mentioned to you that we have 200 active logging concessions in Indonesia. Now we are managing or working within 18 million hectares of Indonesian forest. Out of those, you mentioned that we are 150. 150 units of those have already sustainable forest management certificate and 50 units of those already possess uh, TILAS or SVLK. We are moving forward on this and the question is, can we push this forward? When we, when, we, when we mention that, yes, our illegal activity is going down, in the meantime, why the export is not going up? So I'd like to, first of all, to thank the, the government by, by speeding up the, the per, permit processing by introducing all the e, e government and e-permits process that has been launched last year 
and following that for those concession companies which has already all the permits with has already all the SVL car flag T and also TLAS and so on how can you penetrate global market and can the answer is this part has to be conducted by our our associations last year in November APHI launched the what you call it ITE the Indonesian Timber Exchange which is try to make it closer between the producer and the global market and the consumers 400 consumer all over the world now already intact and linked with our ITE and I think the first export of our timber to the United States was launched just last March and they went to Sacramento, California and we are ready to penetrate more into the US market and also the Australian market. So this is one of the efforts that we have to work together. We have followed all the regulations. We try to reduce illegal logging as much as possible. And at the same time also we'll have to increase the revenue coming from the timber productions. I think we have to follow what as President Jokowi mentioned to all of us in the timber industries and forest industries. We should follow Denmark. We should follow Finland in developing their forest industries. And one of those, of course, increase coordinations and increase consultations between our uh, timber industries, forest industries, and the regulators, which is the government. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to share also regarding the issues of diversifications of our forest industries. We realize that not timber alone. As I mentioned also, we should be able to work with other sectors within the forest industries. Biomass energy was mentioned earlier. We discussed about ecotourism. We did also discuss regarding carbon stock and carbon credits. We also have discussed on agroforestry. Those are activities now ongoing within the associations and we like to Im improve the activities by diversifying our, our products in that area. In terms of the carbon stock and carbon credits, we realize that since Indonesia already signed the Paris Agreement in 2015 and has been ratified by our parliament in 2016, it's become a law. In that issue, it's been mentioned that in the forest industry should be able to reduce the amount of carbon emissions by 30%. I'm very happy to inform you that we are working with Real C, reduce impact logging to carbon. By doing so, we should be able to reduce the, the carbon emissions in the forest sectors from around, how much is this? Uh, 740 million tons into one third of those. 217 million tons by 2030. The real sea has potential to reduce this very, very much, up to 40 percent, with, four, with four, four detailed activities. Number one, better manage of hauling road. Number two, better manage of skid trail. Number three, on better manage of harvested log left. And number four, on better manage of defected trees. So we are moving forward on this area, so with some of the challenges, there are four challenges we like to work with you and looking forward because it's very soon the government will launch the policies on this uh, real sea in which 110 of the active concessions mandated to implement real sea. So challenge number one, I think we have to socialize and develop capacity building for the concessions and potential auditor. Number two, we do monitoring and verification system in the country level. And we should now assess who should do the audit processes. Number three, on the type incentives, for those concessions as working with Real C to provide a good result on the reducing carbon emission, I think this should have some incentive coming from these activities. And last but not least, an incentive mechanism, benefit sharing, and so on, that should be implemented into the real C implementator. 
So I think this is the issue that, uh, that try to answer what has been asked by the committee. We realize that there is some target to be achieved, and I think we are ready to work together with all of us to achieve that target through the sustainable forest management. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bapak Susilo, Indroyono Susilo. Um, now, Pak Ruslandi, Pak Indroyono Susilo mentioned about uh, diversification of uh, products from the uh, concession in which carbon is uh, also included. And he also mentioned about the reduced impact logging C, which is uh, an instrument to do that. So can you please explain this in more in-depth, but briefly, uh, about the reduced impact logging C, which is claimed to, to reduce emission by almost 40% compared to uh, conventional logging. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pa Putra. And it's my pleasure to be here to share our work on uh, reduced impact logging carbon. So actually my uh, presentations or talks will be complement what it has been uh, present by Dr. Indroyono, but I will, look, I will present it in more kind of technical and, and implementation aspects. So uh, from yesterday, actually, uh, many speakers highlight the importance of uh, production forests in uh, climate change mitigation. So uh, that's why in this uh, presentation, we or I'm going to uh, talk about how reduced impact logging carbon uh, can contribute in a reduced emission from uh, production forests in Indonesia. And also uh, yesterday and many, also today, many speak about the challenge of implementation or implementing uh, sustainable forest management and also here I'm going to talk a little bit about the, what is the challenge in, in implementing sustainable forest management. And also, I, I will uh, talk briefly about how TNC could address of uh, these some issues. Uh, could you next to the next? Yes, yeah, so this just showing that there are many complex issues in implementing sustainable forest management. And actually, reduced impact logging carbon is only one of the approach in addressing uh, those issues. And actually, right now, uh, TNC also doing other things to address this issue. For example, we have issue on a business sustainability and a timber yield sustainability. So, and for this, right now, TNC is developing model for uh, business uh, optimizations and diversifications with the objective that it may could increase the, the profit of logging concessions. And also, we explore the potential of uh, silvicultural intensifications to improve the forest productivity. And also, we explore the spatial optimization to balance the goal of the production and conservation. So back to the uh, real C. So it's basically real C is the, the outcomes of the collaborations between TNC and many partners, including the Association of Indonesian Forest Concession Holders, uh, Logging Concessions, uh, Forest Management Unit, uh, East Kalimantan Province, and also, of course, the, the Ministry of uh, Environment and, and Forestry. And if we look at to the next slide, please. So basically, real C have two components. Uh, two components. One is uh, the methodology to quantify the carbon benefit of the improved logging practice, and the second option, uh, the second component of the real C is uh, the set of uh, action to maximize the benefit, carbon benefit of uh, reduced impact logging. And answering the question number uh, uh, from Paputra actually about uh, if we could uh, adopt the real sea in other forest areas. So it's basically here, uh, real sea is a generic methodology with 
which can be uh, tailored to local conditions. So it's the, we, in developing this approach, basically we use the scientific uh, process. One is identifying the, the logging component which have a large contribution to the emission and then the second part of the work is uh, uh, proposing the action to reduce the, the emission from each of the, the component. So right now actually we are doing a study, what we call it uh, real sea pantropical. So in this study we uh, try to implement reduced impact logging carbon in five different countries in in the tropical countries is uh, Indonesia, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, and Gabon in Africa. So it's basically uh, real sea can be adapted to any forest type, any regions, including of course Sumatra and also actually uh, in the next two months the NC also going to scale up the real sea into the Papua and West Papua. And for, for the next question, uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this, the, again, we need to answer why we, we need uh, real sea to be considered in, uh, in the emissions uh, reduction options. So it's basically, it's clear that uh, Indonesia has a large area of production forests, and right now, it's like it's about 20, per, uh, 20 million hectares are under uh, logging concessions, and also, Actually, this, the most important thing is that the real sea is the cost-effective options in climate change mitigation compared to other, for example, avoid deforestation or, or reforestation. And also, the important uh, reason is also real sea is right now, is the methodology is already available. So that's the, the, the reason, I mean, the most important reason why we should consider real sea in... Uh, uh, emission reduction options of, of Indonesia. And also there is some question about if the real or real sea is uh, profitable. And based on the global study here that the answer is confusing. I mean, some study reported uh, radius impact logging is uh, cheaper, but other study reported is more expensive. So. In, in this context, I think one of the study come from Indonesia and based on that study that real is still a little bit uh, more expensive. So it means that maybe we still need some incentive to promote real sea implementation in Indonesia. And the next, if you want to uh, link the, the real sea with the emission reduction in Indonesia, the, the important question is that how much real sea can reduce the emissions. And actually this, the data from the, the some demonstrations the NC have done with the partners, that in average, uh, uh, emission from the logging is about 51.1 tons uh, carbon per hectare. And then by implementing real sea, it could reduce between 26 and 50% compared to the baseline emission. So if we assume that uh, the emission reduction from real sea is 40% and then the, the annual cutting block, block per hectare for the whole concession in Indonesia is about close to 500 hectares and then uh, real sea could potentially reduce the emissions about 24 million CO2 per, per year. And the next, yeah, so this is the, I mean, it's the critical question if we want to use the real sea as the option for climate change mitigation that, is it doable? Yeah, so this is the, the, I mean, the evidence that this is doable based on the, the, our uh, case in Iskalimantan. So it's under FCVF carbon fund. So here we, we, we look at the graph that the, the logging emission current, currently is contribute to the 13% of the total emission in East Kalimantan. And the target for the emission reduction is that 29% are expected from deforestations. And based on our studies, uh, real sea could reduce 40% emissions. It means that at least real sea could contribute to 13% of the 
emission target reductions in, in East Kalimantan. And finally, these two uh, activities needed if the, this uh, potential is to be reality. Which is we need uh, capacity building for the logging concession and also KPH for implementing reduce impact logging. And also, of course, uh, we, we should develop capacity of KPH in uh, how to do the monitoring and auditing. And if Indonesia want to use this as the option or in a national strategy, and then we could uh, scale up the model in East Kalimantan to national level. Thank you. Thank you, Pak uh, Ruslandi. Explaining the real C, please. Uh, yeah, we will further discuss later on. And now I will move to Pak Suryono. Pak Suryono, uh, nanti belakangan saya terjemahin uh, bahasa Inggris supaya yang lain mengerti. Uh, Bapak adalah bukti hidup bahwa manusia itu bisa berubah. Yeah. Jadi Bapak dulu uh, menebas hutan untuk menanam sawit. Sekarang Bapak tidak lagi menanam sawit, tapi pindah ke hortikultur. Ya mengapa kok tiba-tiba bisa, mungkin bukan tiba-tiba ya, kenapa bisa begitu. Dan uh, apa capaian Bapak dengan melakukan itu, yang uh, baik, finans, baik secara ekonomi maupun kepuasan batin mungkin. Dan apa bentuk kerjasama Bapak dengan perusahaan. Dan apakah Bapak kemudian berbagi hal itu dengan teman lain, apakah ada masalah. Ya. So... Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Suryono is a living proof that people can change their uh, attitude toward forest. So he was uh, someone who, uh, who involved in uh, cutting, burning forest for uh, cultivating uh, palm oil, oil palm, but now uh, he stopped doing that, he instead plant trees, and uh, he would like to share why, why is that changed, and what he, he, he got from that, and uh, whether there's still a problem, and uh, whether he is willing to share that to other uh, colleagues in the field to scale up uh, uh, the process. Yeah, Pak Suryono, silakan Pak. Baik, terima kasih. Ya benar apa yang disampaikan Pak Putra ya. Kita dulunya itu adalah petani kebun sawit yang di tahun 2013 ke bawah. Nah di situ kenapa sih kok saya beralih ke holtikultura? Nah di situ kita mengingat di tahun 2013 sampai 2000 ke bawah itu Indonesia itu sering mengalami kebakaran hutan ya. Nah, kebakaran hutan itu diakibatkan oleh penambahan lahan dan penambahan lahan yang pasti karena di sana khususnya di Riau itu masyarakat antusias dengan perkebunan sawit sehingga kebun sawit ini ketika ingin menambah produksi menambah pendapatan otomatis harus menambah lahan nah itu di situ kita juga ingin bagaimana sih supaya masyarakat ini pendapatannya bisa meningkat tapi kita tidak harus merusak hutan gitu, tidak harus menambah luasan lahan. Nah di situ tentunya kita menjadi bumerang bagi masyarakat ya kan mustahil ya lahan yang sedikit kok hasilnya bisa meningkat. Nah di situ kita buktikan. Nah di sini kita lihat eh, kebun sawit saya yang sengaja kita alih fungsikan menjadi tanaman hortikultura. Kita harus buktikan kepada masyarakat bahwa Tanaman hortikultura ini juga bisa menghasilkan lebih baik daripada tanaman kebun sawit gitu. Kenapa sih? Karena di hortikultura ini kita bisa menanam berbagai komoditi ya. Bisa tumpang sari di situ. Kita bisa mengatur pola tanamnya. Beda dengan kebun sawit gitu. Kalau kebun sawit kan sebaik-baiknya produksi itu udah terukur. Dan harga itu udah ditentukan oleh perusahaannya gitu oleh pembeli gitu di sini kita di hortikultura buktikan bahwa di sini petani bisa mengatur bagaimana kita dalam bercocok tanam kita harus mengatur kalender musim kalender tanam sehingga 
di bulan apa sih kita itu bisa dapat harga. Nah kelebihannya di hortikultura di sini. Nah di sini memang untuk merubah sistem itu nggak hal yang mudah ya, nggak hal yang mudah, butuh perjuangan. Kita jatuh bangun, jatuh bangun, tapi bagi saya jatuh bangun itu adalah guru. Nah itu di sini, nah di sini kita juga ada bermitra dengan beberapa ada perusahaan, ada juga Pemda. Kita dibina oleh nah di sini ada pembinaan pertemuan antara kelompok tani dengan perusahaan. Apa sih yang diberikan kepada perusahaan kepada masyarakat? Perusahaan memberikan bimbingan bagaimana petani ini bisa bercocok tanam dengan baik. Di sini perusahaan memberikan bantuan modal, bantuan bimbingan dan juga bantuan pemasaran. Kenapa sih kok masyarakat berharap bantuan pemasaran? Kan selama ini produk dari pertanian ini Pak yang menjadi kendala itu adalah pemasaran. Ketika petani panen harga anjlok, ketika petani panen booming anjlok. Nah itu ketika harga mahal ini menjadi pembahasan tapi ketika harga murah biasa tidak pernah dibahas. Di sini kita petani sendiri harus bisa mengambil bagaimana sih supaya jangan booming. Nah itu kita petani harus mempunyai kalender tanam dan kalender musim. Supaya ketika petani panen itu kita bisa mendapatkan harga yang baik. Nah itu yang kami lakukan di sana dan Alhamdulillah dengan lahan yang tadinya cuma 2 hektar itu kita tanam sawit yang produksinya rata-rata per tahun itu hanya 10 sampai 20 juta kotor di sini kita buktikan dengan tanam hortikultura di tahun 2015 awal kita kerjasama dengan perusahaan itu per bulan kita udah mampu produksi kotor 10 sampai 15 juta. Nah, di tahun 2017 tahun 2016 itu produksi kita udah bisa meningkat 15 sampai 25 juta per bulan kotor. Nah di tahun 2017 itu kita udah bisa produksi rata-rata per bulan itu 25 sampai 35 juta. Nah di situ kita rubah sistem lagi bagaimana sih agar produksinya meningkat. Kita gunakan teknologi-teknologi yang modern, lahan yang sama juga. Bagaimana? Ya kotoran dari limbah-limbah dari pertanian kita kelola jadi kompos yang akhirnya mengurangi angka pembelian pupuk. Nah, di situ kita di tahun 2018 ini kita alhamdulillah kita udah bisa produksi rata-rata per bulan itu 40 sampai 50 juta dengan lahan yang sama. Nah, ini di sini kita punya target dalam tahun 2018 kita per tahun harus bisa produksi dalam lahan yang 2 hektar itu minimal 500 juta. Dan alhamdulillah itu di Tahun ini baru di bulan 4 itu kita udah bisa produksi 400 juta dalam 2 hektar. Nah ini, di sini kita kembangkan kepada masyarakat. Bagaimana kita mengembangkan masyarakat? Karena masyarakat ini maunya instan. Instan mereka bekerja dapat duit. Nah di sini kita pakai sistem mempekerjakan masyarakat tempatan bagaimana mereka sambil bekerja sambil belajar. Nah ketika mereka paham, kita akan lepaskan mereka dengan memberikan bantuan modal apa yang telah dititipkan kepada lembaga oleh perusahaan. Di situ kebetulan kita di desa itu dapat suntikan dana dari perusahaan Pak Hibah ke lembaga. Di sana ada namanya lembaga DMPA, Desa Makmur Peduli Api, itu 230 juta. Itu sistemnya bergulir kepada petani. Ketika petani udah panen, modal dikembalikan ke lembaga, lembaga akan menggulirkan kepada petani yang baru lagi. Itu sistem yang kita terapkan. Di tahun 2015 kita baru punya tenaga kerja dua orang, 2016 kita punya empat orang, 2017 kita punya lima orang, dan di 2018 alhamdulillah kita udah bisa membiayai 10 keluarga Pak. Kita udah bisa punya tenaga kerja 10. Dan itu target kita insya Allah tahun ke depan kita udah bisa petani-petani yang lain yang kita bina ini bisa mengembangkan dan alhamdulillah berjalan tiga tahun udah empat petani yang mempunyai tenaga kerja. Jadi di sini apa yang saya ambil dari perusahaan? Di sini perusahaan mampu membimbing masyarakat bagaimana masyarakat itu mampu menciptakan lapangan kerja. Mampu menciptakan lapangan kerja gitu. Cuman ada beberapa kendala bagi kami petani di sini yang selalu jadi permasalahan itu tadi di pangsa pasar bangsa pasar kadang harga yang tidak stabil dan tidak semua petani itu mempunyai kalender musim pak 
tidak semua petani bisa mempunyai kalender musim. Karena kebetulan di wilayah kami itu memang wilayah industri. Dan kita ingin mengembangkan ke daerah-daerah yang lain bagaimana petani juga menyadari agar kita ini menambah peningkatan produksi ekonomi tapi tidak menambah luasan lahan, memanfaatkan lahan yang ada. Bagaimana bisa menambah produksi tapi tidak harus melakukan perambahan hutan. Meningkatan ekonomi bagaimana memanfaatkan limbah-limbah yang tadinya terbuang. Tadinya sampah-sampah itu dibakar, kalau sekarang alhamdulillah kita limbah itu kita jadikan pakan ternak, kotoran ternak kita fermentasi jadikan pupuk. Nah itu sistem yang kita buat sekarang. Cuman di situ kita ada mengalami kendala sedikit teknologi. Untuk pembuatan kompos tentu kita butuh proses, mesin, segala macam. Dan untuk pemanfaatan ini kita juga butuh bagaimana bertani ini terpadu. Kita berharap kita ada ternak, ada ikan. Kenapa sih kita harus terpadu? Limbah dari ikan itu kita buat untuk penyiraman airnya. Limbah dari tanaman, misalnya batang jagung itu kita jadikan makanan ternak. Itulah kita bagaimana agar lokasi yang ada itu bisa kita jadikan beberapa komoditi dan beberapa ternak. Mungkin itu, terima kasih. Ya. Baik, terima kasih Pak Sileno. Uh, menarik sekali. Uh, jadi, uh, in short, uh, uh, why Pak Suryono shift from uh, planting uh, uh, palm oil into horticulture? First, because of the self-awareness, because when he he deal with uh, when he cultivate uh, palm oil, it always involves burning, which create problem to uh, many people. In addition to that, he he found out that uh, cultivating horticulture is much much more beneficial than uh, cultivating palm oil. In which, uh, uh, in terms of palm oil. He cannot control the price, he cannot control the uh, production, but when doing uh, culti cultivating horticulture, he can do a lot of control on that, and uh, he got, uh, in terms of money, much, much more uh, amount of money per month. And he is uh, now expanding what he practiced to other uh, group of farmers. Uh, they are also... Uh, Uh, still uh, constraints like uh, post harvest uh, marketing and uh, technology. So, uh, uh, our colleague uh, Dr. Uh, Trant Long, now I turn to you. Uh, you are from INBAR, uh, International Bamboo and Rattan Organizations. Yeah. Um, It of course relates to the diversification of production from production forest mentioned by previous speakers. So uh, let me see. Uh, the question already uh, sent to you. I'm sorry. Uh, um, um, uh, let's see. Wait. Um, Yes, uh, well, actually, what, what's the effort of IMBAR in promoting those uh, non-timber uh, forest products? Uh, and whether there's already a roadmap on that, and whether there are example of good practices, success story, and what is that? So please explain it, uh, hopefully, in five or six minutes, so we can have uh, more discussion on that. Please, sir. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, on behalf of INBA, I would like to thank you to the Envi uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry from Indonesia, uh, invite us for joining this uh, summit. Uh, to answer the question, probably first I would like to say briefly about what is bamboo and rattan, what they are capable of. So, uh, I have a uh, presentation. Can you show me some slides? Okay, um, if we, it's at INBA already started in working or established in 1997. We are a treaty organization. We currently have 43 member states uh, across from Latin America, Asia, Africa, and Canada. So in order to, afford, uh, to, to uh, 
promotes the use of bamboo and rattan. We already in the past, we conduct mostly the research by organization to study what bamboo can do, what can use it. And now we are moving to a phase that is more implementation. What you can on that, now, now we can do with it. So um, to study on that, we know that bamboo and rattan is, uh, if we look at the at DZ point of view, bamboo and rattan can contribute to at least seven sustainable development goals. So one is poverty alleviation, seven affordable uh, and, and clean uh, energies, 11, 12, 13, 15, and 17. I just named it out that. If we look at practically in what we are talking in this morning section, we are concerned about uh, sustainable forest management, land restoration, and climate change. I will say that about these three things, what bamboo can contribute to land restoration, uh, climate change mitigation, and reduce pressures on uh, forest products. After that, I will show it for what INBA will do in it. Uh, if we know that it's more than 1,600 species of bamboo cross all the tropical to subtropical region. Bamboo uh, belong to the rat family. They can grow in degraded soil, very poor soil condition. Unfortunately, they cannot go on the peatland. Therefore, they are very good for using it for land restoration. We had already a number of examples, case study and uh, uh, projects established in different regions of the country. We found that using bamboo for land restoration it is economically viable, ecologically uh, viable, viable, and social accepted. Uh, for example, it's a project we do it in India. In, it started in 1997. It's called Greening the Red Earth. Where is the area it was totally mined clay for making brick? And after that, the soil totally degraded red dirt. They cannot grow anything there. So the first in bar project starts there with select uh, six, for six bamboo species and start to establish bamboo plantation there. After 10 years, the water ground table increase, the soil fertility improve, then local people start can uh, interplant trees, and later now they can plant trees and crop there. That is how we say about the capability of bamboo using for land restoration. They have a very good uh, root system and rhizome network. They have very effective control in soil erosion. And then, um, if we look at the climate change uh, mitigation, when you start to restore the land with bamboo, one hectare of bamboo, they can store between 94 to 390 tons of carbon per hectare. If you compare to timber, probably it's lower than trees. But the other advantage of bamboo is that the annual carbon sequestration rate is very high. It's ranging between 2.5 to 25 tons carbon per hectare per year. It's much twice faster than uh, trees, fast growing trees. For example, eucalyptus is just around 10 tons a carbon per hectare per year. The other thing is, bamboo is very easy to manage. It's a grass family, so where you cut, they grow. If you don't cut them, they will grow in uh, slow down. If, for example, mushu bamboo, if under managed, you can get around 12 ton, 12 ton of uh, annual carbon sequestration is around 12 ton per hectare per year. But if you don't manage it, it's around 1.5 ton. Uh, carbon per hectare per year above ground carbon uh, biomass. It's much lower, but when you cut it, you just cut its simple principle, the calm older than three years, no more vegetative production anymore, you cut it, the new one will come to replace. That's an advantage. And look at making the product, can you move it to, uh, okay, that's okay. Look at the making the products, 
In the past, we used that a simple without treatment, making handicraft, bamboo product could last for a few years. So carbon storage in the product is not much. But now, with the technologies, you can make bamboo products stay for 30, 50 years or even longer. Then all the carbon will lock in the product. The annual high rate of carbon sequestration, you make into product, you lock carbon into the product. That is the advantage there. Yeah. Furthermore, bamboo product is carbon uh, intensity low, or even if you uh, export it to Europe, because of the end life cycle, they use it for uh, generation of electricity, then carbon negative. So that is very good for uh, 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 climate change mitigation aspect there. And look, now it's also zero energies. In many areas, that usually they use firewood from trees for cooking and making charcoal. I talk on other projects that we are working in Tanzania, in the district that is Empire. Empire that project there. The local people there, they are uh, zero farming, sustained farmer. They are short of uh, uh, energy, it works from uh, firewood. They just collect tree, uh, cut trees, making charcoal, and then for cooking and for marketing. The reason of making charcoal in this way unsustainable, the forest degraded. So they have large area of degraded land, lo losing forest. So in Bapo, they come there to support them for set up a bamboo restoration project in the degraded land. Combined with that, we set up bamboo uh, enterprise that we will work on first handicraft using existing bamboo in the area and making bamboo energy that make being bamboo uh, charcoal. You can see that honeycomb, bamboo charcoal there. Oh, sorry, very good. Okay. So at the end of this, they, go st they stop cutting tree for making charcoal. Why the people in uh, benefit from selling charcoal and selling bamboo handicraft? Annually, as currently, monthly income of the rural household increase 200 US dollars per month. That also, um, it's really just the farmer is really appreciate with the project which approach on that. And how is we promote our um, in bar how to promote the, the uh, uh, all the bamboo work is that we collaborate using approach it's South South collaboration. We be in China, there is a leading bamboo industries in the world. We use their technology have been already researched there. Set up the South South collaboration. For example, Tanzania and China, or Ghana and China, the project on that. We share the technologies, transfer technologies. So how is that? It build up the technology or from well established country to the country have very little knowledge on that. Now, oh, it's one more minute. Oh, okay. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> I, I still have some, several questions on related to roadmap and thing, but I think I can answer you later. Probably it is too long for 30 uh, minutes, it's not, uh, 30 seconds is not enough. So I will be here. If you have any further questions, I will uh, be very happy to answer you all. Thank you very much. Yeah, actually, yeah, the, our last speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Nuno Suprianto from Gajah Mada University. Uh, Pak Nuno, being a scientist, please share your uh, views on the effort that the uh, countries or government of Indonesia has been doing in uh, recent years, especially in uh, uh, Achieving sustainable forest management, like uh, improving the access, uh, uh, the access of the communities to forests. So, uh, maybe maybe you have further suggestion also how to improve that. Please. Thank you, Pa Putra. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen.
government of Indonesia, especially uh, Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry, uh, yeah, have several program to improve sustainable forest management. Mr. Uh, Pak Dr. Hilmal have already also uh, mentioned it, yeah. And then Pak Indro also, yeah. It's also yeah, mentioned it in the presentation. Regarding to um, uh, carbon, yeah, carbon low management. Yeah. It is also a program from Ministry of Forestry and Environment. And in the uh, forestry sector, the implementation is uh, real carbon. I would like also to answer a question from Pak Pulta delivered uh, four days ago yeah, about the result from the NC result. Yeah, uh, about 40%, 40% reduction, redu emission reduction. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the NC, yeah, prepare and apply a uh, good uh, research, yeah? research design and also a good logical framework. Yeah? Uh, TNC has also a uh, sufficient sample in East Kalimantan and the result is also traceable. The reduction, uh, forty percent, yeah, but uh, about twenty to fifty percent yeah, is come come came from uh, reducing uh, logging road width yeah, to twenty five meters, and then and then replacement yeah, bulldozer for skidding with monocable. Yeah, Mono cable is uh, made in East Kalimantan, Pak, yeah. made in East Kalimantan, and then uh, from failing. Yeah. But I find uh, a little weakness in this uh, study. Yeah. There is no inventory data yeah, about uh, initial um, above ground above ground carbon stock. Yeah. The data is uh, estimated from three, three study also in East Kalimantan. Yeah. Overall, yeah, I agree with this uh, achievement, yeah, with this result. Yeah. And I would act like also to uh, uh, what is this? Yeah, but if uh, harvesting is uh, important yeah, in forest production, yeah, it is a source for income to finance all forest management activity, and also harvesting is uh, important yeah, for forest recognition. In another hand, yeah, harvesting lead to several uh, damage, uh, both to environment, to forest soil, to uh, stand structure yeah, in selective logging. Therefore, it is uh, urgent need to replace yeah, logging method that high negative impact with uh, looking at or harvesting method with low impact, uh, low negative impact. 
from several resort, yeah, from especially from tropical countries. Yeah. Next, please. Implementation of uh, reduce impact looking uh, can reduce uh, all negative impact. Yeah. About 40 percent reduction yeah, in residual settle, residual stand damage, in also yeah, forest soil damage, and uh, wood waste also uh, reduce. This reduction, reduction, reduction yeah, is built in line with reduction of uh, emission. Next, please. Reduce emission has come from uh, reduction um, egg house gases, yeah, egg house gases from skidding, and then uh, low damage, uh, low debris, low broken pool, wood debris, and also. Uh, low waste uh, lead to uh, low carbon release to atmosphere uh, through uh, decomposition processes. It is a uh, apa long time process. And then uh, smaller open area for skidding trail, for log landing and also for uh, looking road uh, will uh, also decrease the uh, greenhouse gases from soil emission. Emission. Thank you, Pia Marswa Putra. impact logging in general uh, from the scientist point of view this uh, process is a uh, uh, very good one uh, only there is one critics or questions it's regarding the absence of initial above carbon above ground carbon stocks uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, like before, uh, we have 30 minutes left for question and answer. Please, uh, I would invite all of you uh, to raise a question to speakers here. And please identify yourself and to whom the question is uh, addressed. So, Pa Iman Santoso from CI. And who else? Uh, none? Uh, oh, from uh, left side, yeah, please identify. And two more, maybe? Uh, okay, from Hock, Dr. Hokma and the other gentleman left side. And another one? Oh, yeah, from a uh, lady here. So, Pak Iman, uh, gentleman there, Pak Hokma, and the other one, and the lady. Please, Pak Iman, make it briefly. Thank you, Pak Putra. I'll try to be very brief. Uh, as mentioned by Pak Indrayono, that uh, we are going to, uh, Indonesia is going to divorce the production from the production area of forest, Indonesian forest. The problem is that when, and I, I believe that we are, we are going to be successful in that, but the problem is that uh, all of the product, uh, product that is result of the management of the production forest will not be accounted as a forest product in national statistic. Meaning that uh, at the end, there will be no increase in the revenue in the so sec uh, forestry sector. So I would like to ask uh, from, um, our colleague from Asia Pacific region, where we are living in the very fortunate land and fortunate weather that everything can grow in the 
uh, in the land, forest land, in, in tropical zone, how you will uh, advise the government that in appreciating the forest sector, it should not be uh, taking account of the number from GDP because GDP is not reflecting the forest uh, surfaces that have a high value in the uh, economy of the country. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Paiman. And uh, uh, gentlemen on the left, please identify yourself. Not working? Okay, don't, don't push anything. Yeah. It works, it works, it works. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for uh, the, the chance, the opportunity, uh, for the time. Uh, I am Mohammed Isham from Sebelas Maral University. I want to address my questions to Pa Indroyono Susilo and Pa Nunu. Uh, my first question is uh, about uh, sustainable forest management. Uh, here mentioned that uh, we in this in this forum we focus uh, more on production itself while I think that uh, to assure the continuity of production we should also consider about not only uh, the economic economic or, or the availability availability of uh, supply but also we should consider about uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, in environment but we should also consider about uh, the social aspect uh, that is uh, the people around forest that up to now uh, we see that people around so, uh, forest uh, in yeah in condition that that uh, and med marginal I mean that that uh, their welfare is is low, etc. So I think that to ensure that we should also consider about uh, the welfare of the people around for us. And then uh, about uh, I want to uh, I want to know uh, how's the result of the results uh, the research about uh, how the impact to. Uh, to environment, whether long hair first uh, forest and uh, short uh, periodical forest, uh, is it whether which one is better? I mean that uh, in long hair first forest, uh, the, the the biodiversity, of course, it will be better, while in uh, in short term uh, hair first forest, uh, the uh, carbon uh, sequestration is, of course, uh, it seems uh, higher than the long harvest forest. Uh, so, uh, which one uh, to be recommended? Thank you. Thank you, Pak. I didn't get your name, but uh, uh, later on, maybe. Um, Pak Hokma, Dr. Hokma, please. Thank you very much, Paputra. My name is Juan Okma. I'm from ITTU. I have one question to uh, Dr. Indriyono, API, and also one question to Dr. Turia from Papua New Guinea. Uh, Indriyono, you pointed out a very important point uh, regarding monitoring and certification system uh, should be in place in country level. Also, you pointed out uh, who will conduct auditing the process. So i like to know the, what, the, I think in terms of auditing, we recognize the importance of the transparency and accountability. So what uh, your some perspective of how to promote the auditing process by the, some of the domestic or national uh, auditor? So you have any some particular suggestion how to enhance some auditing process by the domestic the auditor? 
in terms of the transparency accountability. My the second question, Dr. Turia. Uh, so I like to ask you, you pointed out some uh, big difference, the, uh, like the legality requirement, but the current uh, legal system, the victim, there are a lot of the gap, I believe, in the country of the Papua New Guinea. So can you some share what uh, your the policies on the framework to promote the, like the legality in the Papua New Guinea? And uh, any other some you had also uh, capacity building requirement, particularly the legal the assurance system, and the, some particular uh, capacity building requirement. Can you share with us? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roma. Then uh, back to our friends uh, on the left. Hello, uh, my name is Samejima from uh, yes, IGS uh, Japan. I'm very interested about the uh, presentation of uh, and reduced impact logging. And my question is, uh, uh, now you can estimate the emission reduction you, and you can achieve in Indonesia, but you, maybe you can also estimate the carbon footprint uh, through the timber trading uh, for the Japan. Japan now, I imported uh, maybe less than 30 percent of uh, private uh, exported from uh, uh, Indonesia we importing. So if you can calculate, if Japan import only private produce from uh, uh, Indonesia, Japan can uh, contribute to achieve emission reduction how many cubic ton? I think it is more can be a more strongly strong message to Japan's market. To, uh, to, to, pro, uh, to procure uh, only the, uh, prior from uh, used timber logging and avoid uh, prior produce from uh, land conversion in other countries and uh, uh, can increase the price of the prior from Indonesia in the future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. And our friend here, the lady, please. Uh, my name is Afifa from Gajah Mada University. Before, uh, thank you for the chance. Uh, before, pre before presentation, Mr. Hilman Nugroho have said that HPH and HTI are plus to fulfill the SVLK. My question is for Mr. Indrayono. Is it true that HPH and HTI are plus to fulfill SVLK, and what's the main role of Indonesian Association of Forest Concession Holder on this movement? That's all my yeah, question. Yeah, okay. louder, louder, Is it true that HPH and HTI are pushed to fulfill SVLK, and what is the main role of Indonesian Association of Forest Concession Holder on this movement? Thank you. Okay, there are five uh, uh, questions. Uh, first, uh, mostly to you, Pak Indrayono Susilo. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, from Pak Iman. Actually, uh, Pak Iman raised uh, to anybody in the room uh, asking for advice. Uh, uh, how, how would we advise our government not to look at the GDP when... Uh, when uh, inquiring for the importance of forestry, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, the, the importance of social aspect for and uh, there is also a question to Pak Nunu, uh, a comparison between long, long and short uh, harvest uh, forestry, which one do you prefer? Yeah. And uh, to Dr. Ruturia, probably, uh, uh, Dr. Hokma would like to hear more clarification about the framework on legality, but you already mentioned actually it depends on the national law. And 
the other is very clear. Uh, please, Pak Indroyono. Oh, thank you, Pak Putra. Thank you for the questions for all of you. I think the first question is, let me put it on one nutshell, you know, mostly in how can we improve our forest productivity at the same time also increase transparency and sustain forest sustainability and on forest management. Question number one on social aspect, you know that we are now in the progress of a 12.5 million hectare of social forestry. I think this is the, pres the president himself launched this program. Actually, you should see that the size of our production forest, which is around 60 million hectares, as you mentioned before, 30 or 40 million of those are being used by both HTI and H PH. So, natural forest and plantation forest. Okay. Yes, this is the way to generate revenue, to open job, and also at the same time also to increase the welfare of the people. The same time also there is a program which is a, in which goes into the social forestry program of 12.5 million hectares of those. And we realize also that was mentioned earlier that even though the concession received, for example, 18 million hectares, I think 30% of those being used for conservation, also for, for uh, uh, other activities, non-forest non industry activities. So th this is the issue. So what happened then? How far are we in transparency? I think we are now very uh, fortunate with the, with the information, information technology, with IT and inform, information system. I think all of this is more and more being done electronically. It's mentioned earlier also by the Director General that uh, for the moment, you don't need a face-to-face -face discussion in terms of getting the permits and getting the license. Those are the issues now in order by after that, into to penetrate the global market, we saw we go also into what we call it Indonesian timber exchange. We have to find our what do you call it uh, customers all over the world, and we we from Indonesia can communicate with them, can doing some transaction directly with them, regardless if those a big company or small company, because with the inter, with the information technology right now we can do transactions very fast. I know that there is some groups will get the problem, which is the intermediator. We don't need intermediator anymore. The producer, small producer, middle, in, middle producer or large producer can contact directly with the large, large producers. So the question from the lady uh, on my right hand said, mentioned what happened with the SVLK and so on. I think with this program, with this uh, export penetration, all of those Customer always asks all the certificate, SVLK, FLECT, SFC, you know, TILAS, because they want to have real legal timber. I was, very, I was very happy to see that the number of illegal activities going down and going down, and that's what we want. I was realized when the President Jokowi mentioned, follow Finland, and I tried to review what happened in Finland. Yes, it was fairly close. It, Everything is legal, everything is following the right track, and we should be able, and they are able to increase 20% of their GDP coming from forestry. Even though the size of the forest itself is very small compared to us, they are only 20 million hectares, we have 120 million hectares. Those, those are the two differences that we should be able to proceed. And thank you for the challenge that now we go, we know that there is a target that has been set by the government, and it's time for us to proceed with that and to do it in sustainable manner. Thank you. Thank you, Pak Indroyono. Um, well, the, Dr. Turia, yeah. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Ma. I'm not sure that I really got your question, but if you recall, um, PNG was implementing an ITTO-funded project in 2010 on Flag T. But as I mentioned, I think at that time, PNG was, um, even though we tried to implement that project, I think the idea was that 
we wanted to have some traceability on what happens within the country and when it's traded or the timber products that are traded. That particular project finished in 2013. Unfortunately, the system that was designed as part of that project, we couldn't use it because the consultant that designed that project for us, which was Helveta, they decided to take off that system off the website. So we didn't have the opportunity to use that system. That was why I mentioned that currently PNG is using, on the basis of that report, some of the work that came out of that project, we're developing a timber legality standard. And the standard, which is uh, what we're working on, is based similar on some of the principles that some of you are now applying. And we have for us currently, it's, we just have six principles. And there's about 21 criteria and probably more than 100 indicators. So that's the document that we are currently working on, which we have to take through, through the normal government process before we can say that we have a standard that we can use in order for us to say to anyone who wants to buy timber from PNG that it's from a legal source as per the requirement that we have come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think there is also a question to you, Pak Ruslandi. Uh, it's about the reduction of carbon emission from real, if that can be uh, clearly uh, uh, stated, it may it can give a strong message to the market in, for example, in Japan uh, to buy only wood that is produced from reduced impact logging. Uh, so, uh, how would you make it clearer to the consumer on that? Uh, thank you, Pak Putra. Yeah, I think related to that questions is really, I mean, is the question if, like, if we could use like the benefit carbon benefit of re, real C as the marketing strategy. I mean, yeah, of course, definitely. I mean, if, I mean, it's, it's basically, it's not different from other, let's say, certifications. So we use the real C as like other uh, type of a certification. For example, we could promote that this uh, timber is produced from, let's say, PHPL certified concession and also uh, the same kind of approach, we could also use that this uh, timber is produced from the area that has been uh, harvested using the real sea. So, I mean, that is the, I mean, it's just the way how we, we, we promote the, the real sea. And it's, it's I mean, the, the way how we could do it is basically the same as the other certific uh, certification system or auditing system. And also actually there is, is another opportunity for uh, claiming the carbon benefit that right now real C is only uh, calculate the direct emissions reduction, but actually in uh, 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 wood we harvest, actually there is also opportunity to claim the would harvest the product as the also carbon saving from the real sea. I think yeah. that's the uh, question. Okay. Um, Pak Nuno, uh, there is a question between Which long one is and short aids uh, forests. Yeah. yeah, it's depend on uh, several factor. Yeah. yeah. Once is uh, the ability of the forest to recover itself yeah it's depend also uh, on site yeah? and then second is all about the uh, damage yeah? the level of damage if uh, damage is a, a, a little is maybe good or short cutting cycle but if uh, damage is so yeah I yes, a long cutting cycle is, I think, good. In case of uh, natural production process, uh, I think a uh, long cutting cycle is better. Better for production and also better for environment. Thank you, Pak. Yeah, yeah thank you, Pak So, uh, we are approaching the end. And... I think we all agree that uh, we will not open another round of questioning. 
if it is acceptable, please allow me to sum up a little bit, uh, but not really an exhaustive list of points. Uh, first, uh, we have heard from PNG that uh, for PNG, sustainable forest management is always in the top list uh, of the priority. And of course, PNG is uh, like any other countries, they have their own national law, so legality in PNG it depends on depends on the uh, the national law, and the other uniqueness is that the other difference with other countries is in PNG forest land are owned by the communities. That's a very uh, key point, uh, and uh, until now most of the exploitations done by foreign companies and 90% exported to China. So in this case probably. Um, uh, when we talk about the role of the demand side, here it's even becoming uh, much more important. And uh, with regard to the uh, APHI or the associations, uh, we have heard how the Association of Indonesian Forest Concessions is very keen uh, to work with the government in improving the productivity of forests and also in uh, uh, improving the, the earning of the country from forests, uh, among others through the establishment of uh, ITE, uh, in, uh, what is it, uh, Inter, uh, timber, Indonesian Timber Exchange, yeah. uh, in which uh, transparencies will be guaranteed and uh, closer communication with the consumer will be uh, provided. And um, with regard to reduce impact logging, two speakers explained uh, the, the benefit of this uh, uh, new, well actually it's not very new, the benefit of this uh, innovation in terms of especially reducing uh, carbon emission and also in uh, reducing the cost of the uh, production. And it is very a prospective uh, with associated to that I, uh, the uh, government of Indonesia soon will uh, will produce uh, regulation making this mandatory to all uh, forest concession to implement uh, reduce impact logging uh, with regard to example by Pak Suryono uh, he clearly uh, explained to all of us that that uh, uh, palm oil is not the only uh, is not the only plantation that promise you a lot of money. Uh, in fact, horticulture give can give uh, much more money and more control to the farmers and uh, more friendly to the environment and to the people because of uh, not involving burning anymore. And uh, the other is uh, about bamboo and rattan, although there was no question about it, but uh, Dr. Long already uh, mentioned about uh, the benefit of uh, planting bamboo, especially uh, help in restoring land, very effective in erosion control, and it, it uh, support the achievement of seven SDGs, economically uh, beneficial, ecologically friendly, and socially acceptable a lot of sea and, and many other benefits. And uh, uh, Nunu give more addition on uh, explanation on the real sea importance. So those are points I can get from our discussions. Um, I think it's exactly the time we are allowed to use, uh, 12.30 p.m. Is that correct, Bobby, uh, until 12.30 p.m.? Yeah. So uh, we are very timely in closing this uh, very nice uh, discussion for three hours. Uh, thank you very much for all speakers. Thank you very much for all audience. And uh, please give a round of applause to all of us. Thank you very much.